Hey there, welcome to the special, special Valentine's Day edition of Killer POV. Woohoo! I'm one of your co-hosts, Rob G. From Fearnet and Icons of Fright. I love you, Rob. I love you, man. I love you, Becca. I love you I love guys. You, Becca. And you, I love you listeners. <laughs> I love the listeners too. It's Elric Kane. Except that one guy in England who didn't like our drunken podcast. Oh, whatever. I just That's... like you hard. I like you real hard. <laughs> and, and you'll probably get my love back in one day. Well, I, I I'm wasn't, sure I wasn't as fond of our drunken podcast. It was great. Keep, I'm still apologizing yeah, for it. it by was the way, that's great. Rebecca McKendry. You Hello. should know by now. That's Elric Kane. Hola. We we're back up to speed. Yeah, it was great fun <laughs> to record. But looking back and trying to listen to it, because I was like, man, I wonder if my drunk ass said anything really stupid. And um, when I was trying to listen to it, I was like, God, this is annoying shit. So, um, so you know, in, in small spurts, it's it's yeah. fun. It's fun to listen to. Not that Elric knows because he doesn't listen to our show. And I still don't know what the joke <laughs> is that Morgan said he really, he said, I I, he was, fell off his chair laughing at something I said. And then even when he said it back to me, it had nothing. Nothing, nothing went nothing. off in my head. What did you say? <laughs> something he about remember. kids. Something about does the person have kids? Do they talk? I don't know. What the hell? Yeah, is this Morgan bit. Peter Brown? Yeah, Morgan is saying he'll he'll tell me. But even then I that shows how far gone him. I was. <laughs> even referencing the joke I was over my head. Anyway, that All was right, two so episodes ago. So we should not apologize. Happy anymore. Valentine's Day, guys. Yes, yes. And and I, I came prepared. Rebecca is currently opening a giant heart filled with Hershey kisses. <laughs> that my hand Boom. is going that into yeah, I'm snagging because one Hershey right kisses rule. There you go. And then I also bought for all of us marshmallow hearts. And I gotta tell I can't wait. It was the sweetest thing today because like Rob messages the you know, he's getting chocolates tonight. And I just reminded is, him, I was like, uh, Rob, I have a really severe peanut allergy. So please don't get like pure peanut butter because it's hard for me to be in the room with it at the same time because it makes me, you know, kind of sneeze a lot and my eyes swell up and swell shut. And it's really nasty. Um, and, and I so, said the stupidest thing I've ever said in my okay. life. But in my defense, I was totally I've, I've been flustered all day. I've been running around like a madman. Uh-huh. You know, uh, no, but she's like. She's like, I'm allergic to peanuts. And I'm like, okay, great. And I'm standing in front of the rack looking at chocolates and I see a giant Reese's. And I'm like, oh, hey, can you eat Reese's peanut butter cup? That's awesome. And the second I sent it, I'm like, oh, that's right. They use peanuts to make peanut butter. Oh, yeah. Great. Oh, yeah. Okay. That and was a big exactly leap for you. Clearly. You back. You're like, the main ingredient in peanut butter is peanuts. <laughs> Very like, little butter, oh, but quite a lot of peanuts. I was like, damn it. That's the stupidest thing I've ever said. Yeah. But then I saw the Hershey's Kisses and I'm like, I think this is safe. Hershey's good. And you kind and of marshmallow. Made, you kind of made my day by bringing the marshmallow hearts, which should be fun to eat on air. It's kind of like, you know, doing chubby bunnies well, on air. Yeah, yeah. No one's going to understand anything we say. Hey, now, I, brought beer, nutters. I brought beer too. Fluff or nutter. I've, uh, I, I converted. Uh, me. I, can, I told you to get them for your cafe, and now you love them. Wait, I what's a fluff or nutter? It's marshmallow, it's marshmallow fluff and peanut butter yeah, in a sandwich bread. And I was telling El- Elric that he should get it for Jump Cut Cafe because that was a big thing for me on all the in New York and all mm-hmm. the Long Island coffee shops. I'd always get a cup of coffee and fluff and nutter. And he's like, marshmallow peanut. This is madness. What are you? What are you <laughs> it sounded <laughs> really crazy? stupid. You're to like, me. this is crazy. Who wants that? And then but you know what it tasted later, like? It tasted like, like America. <laughs> And See, I like that taste I of America. I have recommended so many sandwiches to this guy. My new one, brie, apples, and prosciutto. Hey, now. On whole wheat. He's uh, not going to do it. Well, unless you, put, a little crazy. you put peanut butter and, <laughs> and four four marshmallow in it. Fuck the peanut butter. But yeah, so two days later, you, t- you <laughs> posted a picture on Instagram of you eating one. I just And I just saw the tags. What did you say? You were like... <laughs> Something about nothing will be the same. This is my third. <laughs> yeah, that there. was my third. I tried. To, I was going to pretend it was my first, but it was, it was my third. never again. That's I was noticing said. Elric looked a little <laughs> bloated tonight. Yeah. It's the fluffer nutters. It's the fluffer nutters. I'm telling you, it's a there, I'm going to I'm gonna have to back off those. Wow. My Elvis. All right, so let's uh, let's get right into it uh, before our guest arrives. Uh, what have we seen this week? I've seen a bunch of stuff. Okay. Well, well, we did a really cool screening yeah. as yes. a, a podcast. Team um, wait, wait, really cool. It will depend who we ask. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> I don't we think had, cool. What I, I think is a really cool screening. <laughs> um, we hosted a screening of Blood on Satan's Claw at Jump Cut Cafe. And for those of you guys who haven't heard our prior shows about this, it's just a really kind of quirky folk pagan film from Britain. It was in the early 70s, and it really, um, it's kind of a staple over there, and it has no attention whatsoever over here. Show Dante, quote unquote, the best British horror film ever made. Yep. He said that. He said that. On Trailers from Hell, on the trailer. 
So we have so. this wonderful <laughs> screening of it last Thursday night, and I'm all excited. And um, afterwards, I'm glowing because, you know, it's such a cool film. And it's weird. I mean, it's definitely, it's, it's got some flaws, but they're kind of quirky flaws. Like, there's really no protagonist. It's got, ma- yeah, major structure flaws, but, but then you read about it afterwards, and that's all explained. Yeah. But but it ha- but it's not weird. It's not overly weird by like weird British folk standards. It's like it's really not weirder than Wicker Man if you had never uh-uh. seen Wicker Man. Like yeah. first time you see Wicker Man, you're like shit. That's weird. And I and so what is interesting about this whole conversation where it's leading into it's mostly about this is mostly going to be about Rob because <laughs> what what clearly there's a picture emerging about Rob. Uh, first he says, I just don't like Ben Wheatley stuff. I haven't connected it. It's true. Ben, I it, don't. I'm an emerging picture of anti-British. Folk horror is emerging. I can't say anti-modern British because you like things hmm. like The Descent, right? Yeah, I love The so, Descent. So it's not all British films, but um, I can't explain it. I just, again, I, you know, I missed, I missed the Hammer period growing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that I don't like the movies or anything. It's right. just I, I just never got into them. I just missed them, and then now I watch them, and and I mean, I haven't seen a lot. I sort of like them, but they're not the sort of thing where I'm like, oh man, I, I can't wait to watch it again and again. Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of like, eh, okay. But see, I don't think these are like the Hammer ones. I, I kind of agree not, with Hammer, but, to be honest. I, no, no, I love but, Peter Cushing, but I don't necessarily always relate to the... It's a little too well, at arm's length. Okay, yeah. first of all, Rebecca's the only one that saw this movie for our secret killer POV screening. Yes. That's right. For future killer POV screenings, I think we should all agree on the movie. <laughs> but maybe it's fun. Maybe it gives us something. Yeah. I, I, I didn't like it at all. Or what I, about I this? What about it's myself. always something that the other two haven't seen? Therefore, one of you has to show it to see, the other two. I think two. that's fun. Because I could do Arabetto. I've got that one to show you guys. and so That way we can always have a th- that way we can always have a conversation <laughs> about it but i mean lo- i thought it was, i really loved it uh i definitely definitely felt yes i could see clearly the structure problem throws you because uh afterwards about reading about it it, it was uh, meant to be three short stories around the same topic i think directed by different people mm-hmm. kind of an anthology but with the same kind of characters mm. and because at the last minute they probably realized making a feature makes more money or, or anthologies weren't popular anymore you know all the amicus all these companies were changing here and there uh it was put into a feature so you definitely miss not knowing which character to follow except that it makes that linda hayden the creepy girl even more maybe interesting because you, there's nothing likable about her and yet she's the only one you see consistently mm. yeah. um she i thought all the stuff with the girls is fan, like a plus like everything with the girls and creepy satanism and finding the devil's skin all of that's a plus some of the just typical british horror folk scenes or like kind of clunky you know clunky scenes with some of the other male actors what about the judge the the judge uh patrick weimark i had to write his name down who's in a lot of hammer (laughs) stuff he uh, he did a ton of hammer beforehand oh yeah and he he actually uh he goes out blazing in this movie i'm not going to ruin the film for you but he really goes out blazing and um, he, this was his last thing. So it's yeah. pretty cool. If you're going to go out, uh, this is your last movie before you die. This is a, this is the one to go out for. You just ask Rob. Yeah. This is the movie like, you want. I guess. <laughs> uh, what what threw you? Well, the, what? Other, the other thing was that like we, like for, I was completely unprepared that we were going to introduce the screening. So Rebecca puts her on the spot <laughs> and brings us all up. It's like Rob, let's do trivia questions. Like, wait, what's going on? I don't know what's happening here. And somebody, the people booed me when, when I got up. Nobody up. booed and I'm you. Like, Who the hell's boo? Is that Col- Is it my own team? A lot of people boo. I think AJ phoned in a boo. No. They AJ. didn't boo for you guys. They booed for me. Am I the no. unpopular one now? No, okay. that was totally just Collins. <sighs> well, whatever. Uh, no, I just, I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't get it. I didn't get it. I, I couldn't follow. I, a lot of times it's like even the, I don't want to say, just like the, it's like when you're watching a, f- I'm not even, I can't compare it to a foreign film. But I like I almost can't understand what they're saying. Not to Uh, say their accents are too thick, but they're having conversations. And I'm like, and what does that mean? Oh, you mean the the? They kept saying the? The. The must come with me, the. I'd say I I understand that because I feel that way about Hammer films, where no matter how much I watch Hammer, it's not accessible to me is how I always describe it. I understand everything they're saying. I understand what they're doing. But there is just something that kind of makes me keep it at arm's length that says, okay, I just didn't connect with this film on a level. And it's weird because my husband, Dave loves hammer it's like his favorite damn thing in the world to watch i still think the period piece part is part of it i think there's something about watching a horror film in whatever a a period you live in that's set in your period that always connects to you a lot more viscerally or something i don't know because like when i watch cemetery man which is obviously set in kind of a weird offish time period i but maybe that's so contemporary in the way they put it together yeah like that's put together in a way that feels filmed i don't know if that's actually a period piece because it looks like it in some parts but then they have like a limo and then he's in a hospital so but other parts do feel you're right no but you're right some parts do 
feel like middle agey when yeah. he's in the cemetery. Yeah, I was maybe that's say just 1800s, a weird. Eighteen hundreds, but yeah, that, I think that one's just kind of. Off. It's just probably like a weird. But but I do think there's something to that. I, I do feel like those British ones. This felt like um, Witchfinder General. Uh, a little Which bit was of kill actually list. made by the same company, Tion right. made Witchfinder as well, and it did well, and that's why they mm-hmm. did this one. Um, yeah. What else did it remind me of? Wicker Man. There's there's like three or four things that it had a similar tone. I wouldn't say it's. Uh, Overall, maybe as strong as those, but the parts that are good are as good, if not better at times. Like the stuff with her eyebrows and her trying to seduce the priest. There's a really great scene in there. Mm-hmm. Right. I thought, okay. but, um, but you know, it's, but there was a lot, he, Rob wasn't alone. So in defense of Rob, I think I heard, I mean, half, maybe more than half really didn't mean you and Brian loved it, but there was a lot of people coming out going, no. <laughs> no, no, it was the same way. After a couple of weeks ago, we um, worked with Millennium and hosted the screening of Frankenstein Created Woman for Hammer. Oh, yeah, I didn't care and for like, that. I didn't like it either. And I thought I, it was really yeah. boring. And so, like, huh, most okay. of us left going, "Man, that one was just kind of." Ugh. Yeah, it was one of the. I, th- I really thought that was one of the dollar Hammer films I've seen. Just never had that. I don't know. It had a couple of interesting moments. I liked Blood and Satan's Claw like yeah. ten times more than that. Yeah, but like the Hammer film, I always urge people to say who aren't Hammer, and we, and we were talking about this after because mm-hmm. again, the tone was there is um, Devil Rides Out. I think if you haven't seen that, I'm not sure if it's on blue yet. It's a good Valentine's it's, Day film as well. Yeah, it's oh. it's my favorite kind of invoking the devil type movie, but it's also the one that feels the most contemporary of all of Hammer's stuff because they're more like educated people, Christopher Lee place, you know, they're trying to, having a kind of, a, not a seance, but whatever they're doing uh, in this old house. And it's really good. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's Terrence Fisher. So it's just, it's one of the Hammer films that I always, think about you know it's probably the only one where it's not just uh, frankenstein dracula you know yeah, even yeah. though that stuff's iconic and fun yeah, yeah i kind of like dracula ad the 1972 oh, yeah. yeah. i think it was um but that dracula one's trying hard right to be contemporary it's trying it's like, to be so hip and yeah. so mod it's pretty much like dracula yeah. in a leisure suit but yeah. it's fun yeah so no it's like fun that one but, but um, yeah. I also saw last night um, my landlord, of all people, had kept asking me if he could borrow my copy of Burnt Offerings. And mm. I was like, I have a copy of Burnt Offerings. You know, OK, I fine. definitely do. Um, <laughs> so he borrowed it and he returned it yesterday and he was like, this is an amazing. I love this film. I'm so glad I got to see this again. And I was like, Dude, I don't even remember mm. it. So I went back and watched Burnt Offerings again last night, and um, I know it's one of your fave films. I love it. I just think it's fucking crazy. Wow. And Oliver, Oliver Reed in the pool, I think, is the greatest scene in the history of he cinema. Was, and like, that happened like six times in the movie. No, there's no, a scene it where it's twice. like so okay, menacing. It it's like, what is going on? Like, if these characters are being possessed or what by the house, it's just like, just one of those movies you watch and go, wow, for creepy house movies, this one really is just fucking strange wow. i was kind I've of never bored seen it. yeah Believe it or not, um, i've never seen burnt offerings i was bored I through a large chunk of it to be honest um yeah. a lot of it was just like walking around the house and looking at knickknacks and pictures and here's a clock and close up and things like that um so i was a little bit bored for parts of it but i will say this is pre-shining uh-huh. and if you watch burnt offerings and then think of it as being pre-shining mm-hmm. and pre a lot of these other like haunted house like amityville movies that come out mm-hmm. in the late 70s then I give mad respect to it just because it was doing things that now when I watch a haunted house movie, I'm like, oh, that's like a really trite trope that they put uh-huh. in every haunted house movie. But when you realize that this was doing it before anybody else was, it gets some mad respect. And I don't uh, know. I, I, I mean, that one I would fiercely debate is anything but boring. Really? I don't know if you saw the same movie. Really? <laughs> it's like crazy. All the performances. Oh Betty, you have no, Betty Davis. Betty Davis you have, was fun. Uh, Burgess Meredith. Her. You have Oliver. I mean, they're literally Karen Black. You literally have four of the most famously crazy actors in one movie. But all Karen all doing Black crazy does stuff. is walk around and go like, stay out of this room. She gets possessed. Out of this room, but not till the very end. Uh, spoiler. So, spoiler. Way to go, guys. So, yeah. uh, I think it's a really, you guys watch it and you tell us. I haven't seen it for a long time, but I remember I didn't know what it was, and it came on TV not long ago, like I don't know, eight years ago or something, and I couldn't even believe it. Like when Oliver Reed did this the thing. This thing is like fucking thing. good. Right? I just bit into Rob's we marshmallow, thing. marshmallow thing. This is delicious. really damn good. I have a few titles I want to throw out really quickly, and I'll be brief. One, follow-up to the debates episode. Um, I actually uh, bought phantoms uh <laughs> not only that it was, it was a three pack for i don't like, know how i feel about that it was a three you pack spend money on, on that uh, not only that i spent five dollars on darkness phantoms and venom oh wow. it's like, there's like that was like a twofer of ones that we talked about that night exactly now what's funny is uh my roommate kind of kind of liked ben affleck i think so i was like hey, i'm gonna watch phantoms he's like oh, i'll watch that with you and gotta say it's it starts out pretty strong like it's pretty creepy but the second Ben Affleck and Leif Schreiber and those dudes show up, 
Like they are so bad in the movie. Mm-hmm. Lee it Schreiber's could, freaking terrible in that movie. It could be the worst. <laughs> he's a good actor, been, and oh. it could be the worst that Ben Affleck has ever oh, been yeah. in a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was hilarious because we're sitting there watching it, and finally. I clicked the button to see how much longer is left, and it's like 40 minutes. Yeah. And like, oh. So we gave up with 40 minutes to go. It's yeah. like, eh, whatever. We, you yeah. didn't miss the yeah the bad parts Mm-mm. of the second half. Yeah, I didn't care about that but one. But yeah, Schreiber and uh, Ben Affleck are like unholy bad in that film. Yeah. Really, like there's really something bad. just so fake about Ben Affleck in that film. Totally. You know, I feel like he's smirking at the camera and getting ready to <laughs> yeah. laugh any minute yeah. now. But you proved my point. Beginning part with the two girls just <laughs> wandering point. around. My point was that the beginning part of it with the two girls just wandering around is some really creepy shit. That'd be a nice short. It would, Let's wouldn't it? That. Well, the first 15 minutes that doesn't is short. Pr- that doesn't, it means if you brought <laughs> it up on a debates issue and, and the second <laughs> half is unwatchable, yeah, that, that's a lot. I always turn it off as soon as Ian McKellen shows up. I, I think you watch Phantoms, Wait, not that Trapped that? Ashes no, last Peter, night. Peter O'Toole, Peter O'Toole. thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Peter O'Toole is okay. Yeah, well, no. Peter O'Toole. Okay, we did fast forward a little bit. And he has a, a scene where he's having a screaming match with Ben Affleck. Oh, <laughs> and, and all we could think of during this scene was like, poor Peter O'Toole, this is what it's come to. Yeah. I just, I always wanted the ability from Phantom to open my mouth and not move it, but have words come out. Because I love that effect. It's just so fun. I don't remember. Does that happen in that? Yeah. Oh, it's again, where they just like, it, the, the demon or whatever it is, underground creature oh. will talk through them. So all they do is open their mouth and it talks. Oh, that's it's cool. really, it's neat. I so. guess. And the other one from the <laughs> debates episode that I checked out, um, I broke out Blair Witch 2 again uh, to reconfirm if I liked you it guess. or not. I did. I really like it a lot. And you know why? Because I think it works better with a little bit of time and with I'm glad I didn't rewatch the first Blair Witch Project. Because uh-huh. if you have the, the first one kind of in your memory of when it came out, when you saw it and kind of the phenomenon around uh-huh. it. Now I understand that Joe Berlinger was really making he it it's obvious from Blair Witch Two that he hates Blair Witch One oh, and he's, he's making, making fun of it an yeah. incredible satire about mm-hmm. it and that's the thing like even the characters that are a little hammy are it like there's he's making a point for everything mm-hmm. like one of the girls is a Wiccan and like the way that the, the stuff she has I to remember say that about Wiccan, kind of he's kind of making fun of that mm-hmm. and the same thing with the goth girl he's just making fun of everything what throws it off is that. Like they try to throw in these gore scenes, which are not his. Like, uh, like they tr- they throw in these elements that are supposed to be horror. Um, but then I do like the way that it's like his interpretation of what a horror movie is by the end of it, which uh, is the events that unfold in in the woods that have nothing really to do with the Blair Witch Project. It's just a fun satire on the original. I think it's I think it's an interesting movie on its own, and I think it works better if you just watch it now with a vague memory of the original hmm. Blair Witch. So I think it's it's really cool. That's just me, and it's funny because you look at the first movie. And I feel like the first Paranormal Activity had this too, where this this little indie movie became huge, and the stars of it are on the cover of Entertainment Weekly and talked about, and then they kind of didn't do anything. Yeah. I mean, for Blair Witch, Joshua Leonard did a lot of indie work after that. and I delivered a out. chicken sandwich to the guy. Which one? A Micah. Oh, the guy who plays Micah. There Micah I've seen he's Micah a, sitting in, in your cafe little, before. Oh, really? I went he's into some in little apartment yeah, and I delivered him food and, and I couldn't remember where I'd seen him from. And I walked down and go, oh, he died in Paranormal. Right. <laughs> where is Blair That's the last time I saw him. Blair Witch 2, the lead guy, is now the lead of Burn Notice, that television show. Oh. That's his first movie. Uh, Eric O'Learson did the Texas Chainsaw remake and uh, Wrong Turn 2. Uh, the goth girl is Kim Director. She went out to work on five Spike Lee movies. Hmm. So it's like everybody from t- part two at least had somewhat of a hmm. career after and that. Yet, so I remain unconvinced. <laughs> <laughs> to rewatch this film, what is it about this film? I, I will think sit you down and force you to watch it with me one I'm day. I'm just going to yes. pray one day that Berlinger gets out his copy and I'll watch that. That's all <laughs> I'm going to say on it. One day, if Berlinger ever releases it, I would watch it. Here, That's my fingers, promise to you, Joe. Crossed. I just crossed. demolished that marshmallow heart, Good. guys. I just, I mean, I like suck that thing down. I'm going to jump great. over one real quick. I yeah. just, uh, and then I'll go into detail on one. Uh, I watched the remake again. I haven't seen it since theater as of assault on Precinct 13. Not on purpose, just came on TV. Mm-hmm. Could, too lazy to change channel. But, you know, it's such a well-made movie that you kind of get... Of all the remakes of Carpenter, it's the only one that I think is a watchable movie. It's well cast, and it's just a really... It's very different <coughs> from the original, but it's, uh, you know, Fishburne. Everyone's fun in it. It's really well shot. It's, you know, it's not a horror film. It's But it's, um, yeah, I, I thought it was a really good action film, and that, the guy was super young who made it. I think he's like 24 or something when he directed it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's no, it's no masterpiece, but it was just funny. You know those movies when they come on TV and you just cannot change the channel for some reason, mm-hmm. and it, it was that, you know, good enough. Plus... Uh, you know, t- for most of you guys, it's Tom Atkins, but my other Tom Atkins is Brian Dennehy. 
Like Brian Dennehy to me is so freaking watchable as an American actor. If he's him. in something, especially older Dennehy, uh, like or FX Dennehy. FX movies. Yeah. FX is one of my FX favorites. Dennehy. I love FX and FX Two are both great movies. <laughs> he just is a fucking good actor, and so he he was really well used in it, kind of as the, a slight red herring and stuff. But it's it's a cool movie. But the one I want to talk about. This is serious. Uh, a long time ago, I saw during the Cine Family's ter- thing of terror, I went to, or whatever mm-hmm. it was called, um, I did see Basket Case again on 35, which right. was awesome. And uh, you lent me Basket Case That's too because right. I realized I'd never seen it before. Yeah. And this is appropriate for Valentine's Day. Because it, it, it is, is. You're right. It's very much about finding love, as is the original, but this one's very much for Bilal and for Dwayne. Bilal, yeah. Uh, I think this movie is a fucking insane, crazy fucking sequel. Like it's one of the insane. craziest sequels in the history of cinema. And, and now that you've seen it again, and I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. I say this all the time, of all horror sequels, all horror sequels, yeah. it's my favorite ending to a horror sequel ever. Yeah, okay, so I was about really? to get to that. Here's yeah, the thing. It's my favorite ending this to is a horror the thing. sequel. I don't think, the film itself, I don't think is a touch on the first one. And only for this reason, not because it's not well made and stuff, but because the first one is made with such incredible earnestness and the characters are so likable. Like Dwayne is so likable in the first one because he's like this wide eyed guy coming to the city and he's harboring the secret of uh, which is someone he really cares about, but wants to leave. And the second Dwayne is so like out of it and so like kind of. Uh, kind of just like n- hardly human anymore that he, he becomes kind of unlikable. And then in fact, Bilal is far more likable in the second one, but that, that doesn't ruin the film. The, the, the creature effects are incredible. Greg, yeah. uh, Gabe Bartolos made yeah, all yeah. these other creatures. So they're living with a whole circus of freaks that, that also kill, you know, kills maybe it's believability It's a little more like freaked or a movie like that. Right. But it's awesome. And it does exactly what a sequel should do. It takes the story and goes somewhere else with it rather than rehashing. So I really like that. But, um, when it gets to the end, uh, and I, I don't want to, I guess I just want, I'm not going to even say what it is, but it's, it's the perfect ending to the problem of twin brothers who you, were separated. So you agree with it. It's you agree? I, genius. I love it. I love it. That was one. I totally agree. I, that was a major note I had was like, look, I, I, the tone of this one, I didn't like as much as the first one because the first one's so handmade and so rough. And if you've never seen basket case, just get on it. Cause it's just so authentic, uh, of a period and a place. Um, this one's, you know, a little more mannered and stuff cause the creatures, but it's still a lot of fun and it is a wacky, wacky sequel. Yeah. Um, but the ending is just so good. It's like perfect. I almost don't want to see the third one now yeah, just even, in even, case. Even he regrets the third one, okay. which, which yeah. is, you know, they use a lot of footage from this one, Yeah, but, but maybe still. I, maybe I won't then because yeah. it just was kind of perfect. Yeah. It's kind of how you want to remember that storyline. Yeah. So yeah, you should see it. Great. I have not seen the first one since I was in high school and I haven't seen the second one Ooh, ever. So yeah, no, I, I've seen out. the first we'll one once. we a double feature soon. And okay. Let's do that. And I always liked the creature, but when I started Cinefamily Family on, on a big screen where the humor was really playing to an yeah. audience, I was like, man, it's a good movie. I really think it's one of those great, like it's up there. And it, it's not art like a razor head and stuff like that, but it, I do think it's part of that same handmade horror. You know, that would be a good show. Handmade horror handmade film that horror feels films. like it was made by yeah, some guy yeah, yeah, with sure. no stupid. Studios. But anyway, that's <laughs> that was yeah, that was the big one that got us up to we're pretty much right. I mean, we wanted to we'll go around real quick before we get to our guest and our topic uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, favorite horror couples, couples and harm. I mean, just a couple that we don't have to go in depth. Man, that's tough. I, I didn't get as prepared as you did. But, um, I, you know, what? since you said best case to yeah, mm. Belial and the little creature. From oh, yeah, she was good. To, she, <laughs> there's a, a, a Belial like creature in that. Um, <laughs> uh, Seth Brundle and uh, and oh, you have written down my, easily my fly. number one. I think it's the best one, one of the best love wow. stories ever filmed. <clears throat> and I think of course, I, I, you know, uh, written by the same uh, screenwriter, Charles Edward Pogue, Psycho 3, uh, Norman oh. Bates. And, nice. uh, and the Nun. The Nun, yeah. They wrote Fly. Fly? <laughs> Maureen. He wrote The Fly as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, I think Goldblum and Davis. Too. Also, they just had incredible chemistry because they had a real life of relationship. Yeah. And I think she loves them even during this transformation. And usually in horror films, the, they become kind of hysterical and start running away. She sticks with it and in the situation as long as she possibly can until it's just pure monstrous mayhem. And it's, I think it's one of the best, it's kind of surprisingly romantic for Cronenberg, who I think is often very cold. Yeah. And so it like, it's That's kind true. of, and probably no surprise why it's his big, biggest film. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, that one and my, the other major, you know, obvious one for people is I like the relationship and reanimator a lot. I think again, that, that has the same kind of thing because, you know, he, Bruce and, Abbott and, yeah, and, uh, and Me, uh, Meg, yeah, right? and Meg Halsey. because you know, once she's gone, he brings her back <laughs> in the second one. So the really, the through line between one and two is very, I think pretty romantic. Um, and, and nice. And then a funny one I thought, which would be a joke one is, uh, Christine, and 
um, and Arnie because the car. I mean, that's a real love yeah, affair. Yeah, if, true. if he had just stopped dating and not tried to bring other girls, he would have been happy. He could have just dated his car, <laughs> gone to drive-ins. He would have been set. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are those are ones. And and here's a non-horror one. If you want to see, look up a great film, one of my all-time favorite films, The Honeymoon Killers. If you haven't oh, seen right. it, the guy Never only made, made it one to movie. DVD, right? Uh, Criterion no, have no, now. Yeah, Criterion, Criterion did yeah. put it out. The director okay. only made one movie, and it's it's perfect. There aren't many perfect movies. That's a perfect movie. Like wow. there's not a shot wrong about it. Wow. But Scorsese, That's... I think, was a big fan. Uh, I think he was meant to direct it actually at one point. Um, it's just this very dark, weird, twisted love affair with this giant woman and this weird the guy from um, God Told Me To is the mm. lead Tony Lo Bianca, uh, and it's it's a true story kind of wow. about the Lonely Hearts Killers, and that's just. It's just fucked up. Yeah. Just they're so kind of oh. grotesque, but they're your main characters, and that's what you get. Nice. So, so I gotta check that one out. I've always, I've always seen the Criterion. Great poster. It, yeah. Great image. Yeah, it's yeah. A great movie. Well, my top ten Valentine movies. Um, ten. I did. Well, they <laughs> were. They're going up on Fango tomorrow. Oh, okay. So okay. Um, cool. I have my ten here, but I'm not going to do all ten, of course. So, you can give um, us five. I'll give you five. <laughs> okay. Boom, boom, boom. Um, sixteen year old me still loves The Crow. Oh yeah. Um, I, oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Still, you know, just. Kind of Very creative. grunge music. Even if the writer angsty. of it replaced me at horror trivia night, <laughs> it's Boom. like it's like bad teenage poetry. And every single time it rains in LA, all I can think is it doesn't always have to rain. Yeah, which I it think can't was, rain all the time. It can't rain all the time. That's the it. She always says that to me when yeah. I flick my hair and it's raining. She always turns it me. Can't rain all the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's like my bad teenage poetry makeout. Like nice. I, I loved that movie. Um, Dead Alive, Paquita and Lionel. That's a good one. Good call. Very good call. Thank you. May. Of yeah. course, she doesn't uh-huh. find love until the very end, but um, definitely one of my favorite kind of hopeless love movies. Nightbreed. Mm-hmm. Nobody oh, ever yeah. thinks of yeah. that as yeah. like a That's love true. movie. But and she's a very um, proactive uh, yeah. woman character in that because she goes into the mouth of madness for her dude. Completely. Yeah. And Which he cool. violates Midian to get to her. Yeah, exactly. That's true. So That's it's a great like a true love movie. And I love it because if you're either looking at the original version or the Cabal cut, even though the ending is different they still end up together in varying degrees, which I think is awesome. Rob, this is funny. I finally get why we keep it around. That's Oh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> this list is really good. I will uh, bitch slap that marshmallow out of your Well, head. he buys me marshmallow. <laughs> And you know, <laughs> I bought her marshmallow as well. He did. I I just and ate a it whole off. tub of you really know, good. Yeah, aren't they good? Oh. Um, so here's my deep cut, and I'll end with this one: The Insatiable, because I'm assuming you guys haven't seen it. 2007. Oh, wait, which one is this? Okay, Sean Patrick Flannery stars in it. Yeah, and he is like a really bored office worker and hates his life. And one night while coming out of work, he sees a vampire attack a guy in an alley, mm. and he um kind of becomes obsessed with her and decides he's going to hunt her down and kill her. So he constructs a cage in his basement and he captures her, but he starts falling in love with her. And much of the movie is built out of them talking, Mm -hmm. but you never, it's like most of the movie, you don't know if she falls back because you think she's falling in love with him too. And he's debating letting her out of the cage because she loves him too. Or is she just playing him because she wants to eat him? And so it's a really cool concept and really well done. And it came out in 2000 seven it was like a direct to dvd film yeah i remember that and it disappeared so quickly and then yeah Never even was it like cover. anchor bay it was yeah. i think it was because there bay. was a period around there where anchor bay was doing these low budget i think they were like like stephen J. canal produced mm-hmm. like little low budget horror movies yeah. like devil's den was one that came out with ken foray and i think insatiable was part of that yeah and this one's really smart because it gets into like at one point she's starving and he has to decide whether or not to bring her food. Mm. And um, so, and the bulk of the movie is just the the guy and the girl. And the guy is Sean Patrick Flannery, who's yeah, yeah. just dreamy, yes. especially in 2007. And um, so, I was yeah. a big Boondock Saints fan, so I checked. I I remember checking that movie yeah, out because it's also, a good one. Also, I realized Rob, uh, there would have been one on Rob's list had he prepared uh, Habit. <laughs> <laughs> Habit, of course. Habit, yeah. of course. Yeah. I know That's you well enough to know. Lustful and I will say another classic if you're looking for a good romantic film. Abominable Dr. Fibes is the most romantic of them all. It You don't ever get to really know the wife because she's not alive anymore, but everything he's doing is out of this love for his lost wife, and it's a pretty amazing movie uh, on a visual level. And the other last note I have is just the words, not Stendhal syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> wow. That is not a good romance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, so let's uh, let's bring our guest on. Maybe he can interject uh, with some of his favorite uh, uh, romances and movies, and, uh, and we'll tackle our topic. Stand by. Okay, so welcome back. Um, I I would like to welcome our very special guest this week, uh, screenwriter Todd Farmer. Hey, guys. Hi. Writer of My Bloody Valentine 3D, Drive Angry, Jason X. And some movies that we will never see. 
That, <laughs> or some versions were, of movies we'll never versions see. Versions of movies we'll never see that you've, you've talking about at great length. Both Which now online. I want to read. Like, yeah. well, because we, we had a thing we wanted to do was staged readings of like screenplays that could have been great that you'll mm-hmm. never see. Never get, no. And one yeah. of the ones we wanted to do was one of the Nightmare on Elm Streets. I can't it remember. It was like part Nightmare five. on Elm Street 5 before very, it became a dream child yeah, thing. Yeah, and try to get professional actors and come down and just do stage readings of these things just so you can experience right. what it could have been. And that would be awesome. I would love to see one of yours <laughs> like that. I would that. totally yeah. do that. Yeah, All that'd right. be so fun. I would, we, I would throw Halloween 3D into the mix. I would oh, throw yeah. Hellraiser into it. There's We've got scripts. Now let's get some people together. We'll have some questions about all those soon. Our show. Ghost Rider... Which Ghost Rider was it? Two? Two. Two. Yeah, Two. We, we, the Vengeance we, one. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. We'll get to that, but you have a chocolate marshmallow heart that I got you. Yeah, but it'll be too loud if I try to open it. You could, I you just know, ate, ate mine on air, and it was very loud. Beer. I have to eat it on air. Yeah. Yes. All right, fine. At some point within the next hour or so. That'd be fantastic. So anyway, so we were... Uh, we were uh, we were going to delve into 3D, uh, obviously, since you've done two 3D movies. I have. But before that, um, we were just rattling off a few names of our favorite. Was it? What was the? the I think we're couples? just. It's, well, this is going to play on Valentine's Day, so we're saying yeah. our favorite horror couples. I know you stole one of mine because I, I I would have said Goldblum and Gina Davis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great without one. Without a doubt, unanimous. But you also uh, did you did you say Hannibal and Clarice? Because no, yeah. Yeah. no, that's a good one. Actually, you just opened up uh, an interesting one that I want to do was. Um, I don't want to say love hate relationships, but those type where they're like, like he said, like Hannibal, Clarice, Nancy, and Freddie. Like mm-hmm. they're they're not they're romantic, not, yeah. but there's some sort of weird underlining connection. But that, Hannibal and Clarice are romantic. Well, they, by yeah, the last one, sure. by Hannibal, the film, they're it's mm-hmm. clear yeah. romance. You know? Yeah, although it's you know more so in the books, and it's the same right. with Jared and Jensen. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's supernatural. Yeah, that's a bromance going there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what was the other one I was thinking? Uh, Freddie, Nancy. There was one similar to that as well. Um, but whatever. So, all right. So you give a few of yours. Which, which one did you say? Uh, Freddie Krueger and Nancy. Like that kind of like nemesis, like not a final girl because like every Friday 13th has a different final girl, but yeah. it's like, there's something about, uh, I guess you could say no, they're equals, they're rivals. rivals. Yeah. When you're they're an rivals. equal of someone you oh. respect or. Oh, well, behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon. Leslie Vernon and mm-hmm. the main girl in that. Are Actually, like you're right. That one is borderline That's like romance, a great yeah. romance mm-hmm. sort of arch nemesis sort of setup. So. Did, did you guys uh, mention uh, Janet and Brad and uh, Sally and uh, Jack? Oh. Janet and Brad, Brad and Rocky Hart? Rocky Hart? Oh, nice. No. <laughs> and the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas? Probably my favorite would be Jessica Walker and Clint Eastwood. Do you remember the movie? And Play Misty for me? I play Misty. Boom. Yeah. The original yeah. Fatal Attraction. Yeah, yeah that really is. Yeah. We talk, what did we talk about that last episode for? What was that for? I, it came uh, up for... Because uh, I was talking about Jessica Lange. Favorite female villain. Oh, think, favorite female yeah. villain. Okay, Although that was it wasn't it. Jessica Lange. It was, yeah, because um, I made the confusion. I said, wasn't she in Play Misty for me? And then somebody said, no, that was Jessica Waters. So Yeah. 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 yeah she's great in that. I mean, she, she's so believable. I, I believe yeah. her more than I believe Glenn Close and yeah. Fatal Attraction. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Just... It just could have happened very easily. Well, it's funny because yeah. uh, when I first moved out here, uh, I ended up befriending a guy named Dean Reisner who wrote, um, he didn't get credit on a lot of the movies, but uh, Dirty Harry, High Plains Drifter, mm. uh, you know, Play Misty for Me. Don Siegel stuff. Yeah, all of that. And so mm. the three of them were, were good friends. And, you know, and so Dean was, I think when I met Dean, he was 79. He died when he was 83. Mm. And so, you know, he had, you know, this was the guy who was sort of teaching me how to do what I do. And so that I could have had worse teachers. What did yeah. he teach you about 3D? He t- That's called a transition, <laughs> <Nothing>. my friend. <laughs> uh, he didn't. I wonder if he, he had. If you look back over his filmography, I wonder if he had. I don't think he ever did. No, I okay. think. Uh, no, I don't think he did. But he started out as an actor. He, you know, he was a kid actor. And, but no, I don't think he did 3D because I know his filmography pretty well. Mm. He did Blue Thunder ah, and Starman. Awesome. Ooh, Starman. I love like that Starman. One. Yeah, it's funny because he didn't get credit on Starman. But if you talk to Carpenter, Carpenter will say everything that you like in that movie was Dean Reiser. Wow. Yeah. That is one shocking trend I've discovered in Hollywood. People who actually wrote the film that get no credit for it just because of like contracts or mm. weird legal stuff so that, you know, it, the screenplay credits always go to somebody else when someone else did it. Yeah. Well, it used to be worse back in the day because back in the day, the guild would get mad at writers and just not give them the credit. You can't get away with that now. Wow. I mean, now y- you tend to get the credit when, when you're, you're do it, but still it's. Uh... Are there a lot of projects that you worked on that, that you're uncredited on? Like, you know. Um, what's it called? Like, do, nope. when you do a polish on something, what's that called again? There are a lot of pro- projects that I worked on, but then my stuff was never used. Mm-hmm. Like, I did an early draft of Freddy vs. Jason back after Cy and Ethan did their draft and before the King of the Hill guys did their draft. I mean, I, I was back in the day. Wow. 
And uh, it was that draft was sent back to us. Uh, Cunningham sent that to New Line, and they they had sort of a a bit of a, a feud going on, and so they sent it back to us saying that you know it, it really doesn't work out for us. But it was clear they just never opened the package. Mm. Yeah, oh, wow. it was still it was still <laughs> sealed the way we sealed it when we sent it. So. Oh, weird. Didn't even look at it. Yeah, they never. Have you ever it. had to go to, uh, like through arbitration? Like one thing I've learned a lot lately, people tell me. They've, they've written something. A lot of that was used in a film. Mm-hmm. Somebody else got the credit, and then they've been told by people, insiders, or producers who have said, you just shouldn't sue. You'll never work again. This kind of heavy, like laying it on heavy. Uh, one one case recently is The Expendables. The the guy who wrote the new Godzilla mm-hmm. created the characters in the world of that, and it's in a huge mm-hmm. lawsuit for the last like five years with uh, Stallone, you know, about the rights and money and everything. Mm-hmm. So have you ever had any of those kind of situations? Yeah, I've gone through the arbitration process. Have you ever had somebody say, just don't do that because it's going to hurt your career? Uh, as far as ar- arbitrating? Yeah, or just even I, going into lawsuits. I never arbitrated. Um, I, I'm, I think technically we're not supposed to talk about arbitration, but uh, yeah. like for, uh, <laughs> I, certainly for like uh, Messengers, Messengers, the script that I wrote was changed. There were, I think there were eight sets of writers. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mark Wheaton, who ended up getting credit for the film, I think he was right in the middle. And... Uh, Wheaton got screenplay credit. I got story by credit. And the only reason I got story by credit is because I'm the first writer. You're guaranteed story right. by credit. And um, I think that pays you 20% of the residuals, if I remember correctly. But um, Wheaton got the credit. And there are all of these other writers, and everybody changed a little bit. So when it came time to arbitrate, everybody looked at the script and go, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm never going to win, so no, I'm not going to arbitrate. And so Wheaton ended up getting the credit because nobody arbitrated. And, and that's just what the studio said. It should be Mark. What's the thinking about going through, I mean, from their perspective, not yours, going through eight sets of writers for anything? Like, what, what is the thinking? Like, eh, this part's not good enough, or why are there that many cooks in the kitchen? Man, I don't get it. Um, I, I, I know that there are some writers out there that you can hire that come in, and you're like, you know what? We might have made a, made a mistake on this one. Mm. But for the most part, I think uh, I think it's insecurity. It's covering their butts. You know, if the movie fails, it's like, look, well, we got this guy and we got this guy and we <laughs> hired her and we hired him and, you know, this team and, you know, they just did this and they did that. And so it's it's all about covering and keeping the jobs. Totally I diluted. Think. But I've gone through, uh, I've only gone through one arbitration process and I didn't, uh, I did, no, I actually, yeah, it was, uh, I don't know that I'm supposed to talk about Yeah, you don't have to talk about it. Well, I mean, but your blog is like more honest. Rob put me onto your blog Uh, uh, the last couple of days, and it's more honest than most people are about the industry. I may have mentioned the blog, because back in the day, I would, you know, I would go to meetings, and I would come back and go, God, that guy was a, you know, had a freaking plastic (laughs) spoon for a brain. And then later, I would meet him, and he was like, yeah, I read your blog. (laughs) (laughs) At least you're honest. (laughs) Well, I mean, I don't, I actually don't do that as much anymore. Yeah, Yeah, the uh, the entries have uh, dwindled down. Down well, since, uh, you know, the problem is the executives, they never go away. They fail up. So, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I call him a plastic spoon brain, you know, 10 years ago, and now he's running a studio. So you, know, he's, wow. you have to be careful. Silver spoon, no. <laughs> uh, really quick on, since you mentioned Messenger, you're credited on Messengers 2. Messengers 2 is Messengers 1. So that was your original yeah, I, script the, for the, and that's scr- why. the script that I originally wrote that became the Messengers, hmm. years later they read that script and said, oh, you know what, we should use this as a sequel. Because it changed so much. Wow. And so <laughs> I love Messengers too. Yeah, I mean, it's we, great. We had we had a million bucks. We had no money. Um, the only thing that was different in it is uh, if you've seen the movie, you know, it's a killer scarecrow at the end. Yeah. In in the original draft that I wrote, which was supposed to be for the Messengers, uh, it was more The Shining. At the end of the movie, you realize, oh, he's crazy, and he's he's the one that's been killing everyone, and then he tries to you know kill his wife and kid at the end. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I love that because when I went in and pitched it, I said, "Look, this is the horror version of a beautiful mind." Because there's <laughs> this guy having all these delusional relationships, and ba- it's basically how I got the job just on one that's cool. one little sentence. Wow, that makes sense now because I did a list um, for Fango a couple of years ago of like the top ten sequels that you know you you mm-hmm. might have overlooked, and I put Messengers two on there. I had Pulse two was mm-hmm. on or White Noise two because oh, White Noise nice. two is better than White yeah. Noise one. And um, wrong turn to and things yeah. like that, but that makes sense if that was the original. Yeah. But film when you're now. when you're sitting across the table from Sam Raimi and Raimi says, "I like killer scarecrows," then you're like, you know what? By God, I'm gonna write you a killer scarecrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is exactly what happened. Yeah, I forgot he was uh, that, that was uh, from Ghost House, right? Yeah, that's, that's pretty. It cool. was that was great. Yeah, I mean, because because he was he was great. Yeah, because he had there was no reason he's doing Spider Man. There's no reason for him to be in a 
in a room with me and we're doing a direct to video movie. Mm -hmm. There was no reason for him to take all of those meetings. He was there. He loves horror. He was there every meeting we took. And it was a time crunch because the the strike was about to happen Mm -hmm. and we knew it. So we were trying to to beat the gun. And uh, then they ended up cutting a deal with the guild so I could write during the strike without getting in trouble. Wow. So it was wonderful. I was the only writer in Hollywood actually working. I had three jobs because everybody I was working with cut a deal with the guild. (laughs) So I had three. I wrote Valentine during uh, because New Line or uh, Lionsgate cut a deal with the guild. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh. It was a remarkable time. Everybody else was out picketing, and I was like, God, I ain't got time. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. I, I feel like we should do some of the interview stuff now since we're already yeah, yeah, yeah. Think of it and then go so back I to the So I shouldn't take a bite of this chocolate? Yeah, we, we can, it, let's end it, with our it. general thoughts on 3D at the end. We'll go sure. towards 3D yeah, yeah. Oh, once we get to 3D films. Yeah, uh, no, that makes sense. I guess Jason X is... Uh, I, I haven't read enough to know the history of Jason X, and I don't know if people listening have. Uh, I'm curious to know because I read, I saw some pictures where it was like at an, another Earth or Earth 2. was. So obviously you're going through for something like way more mythic. Talk about maybe how you even came to, to send Jason to space. Was that your idea? It was, sadly. <laughs> no, not sadly. I, I love, look, Jason was here. I put him up there. I take full credit for that. Yeah. So screw all the haters. Um, <laughs> it was a situation where, look, these movies, there there are a million things that are going to happen to try to stop a movie from from actually going forward. And in this situation, Freddy vs. Jason was in development and had been in development for a long time. And uh, DeLuca did not want to do another Crystal Lake movie. Why would he? He's got Freddy and Jason. And so uh, we went to them. My original idea was Blade Runner, which was let's let's take and tell a completely different story years and years later so we don't screw with whatever they're doing, whatever they're planning, whatever they're going to do. And uh, so I, I think I have actually came up with a pretty detailed outline for that. And they're like, we can't afford that. And I said, okay, fine, let's do Aliens. And so that's that's basically how it happened. Um, because I, ne- I had seen, you know, the other movies in space, and I knew that not all of them were great, but... At the same time, I loved Aliens. And mm-hmm. if you look at Jason X structurally, it is Aliens. Right. Well, it's, it's one part alien, one part Aliens. But mm-hmm. it's I completely ripped off Cameron's structure. I mean, they try to escape in the shuttle, so the same thing happens in Aliens. I mean, it's it's their structure. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Did, did you write the kills, or did everything get just re- totally changed? Kills always always change a little bit. But yeah, for the most part, all the kills I, I wrote... Uh, you know, what changed is, you know, on set somebody says, oh, let's come up with the line he screwed, which actually I came up with that. <laughs> there, there was a time when it, 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 I always wanted it to be dark like Aliens. And so this, the problem is Scream came out. And Scream, was, Scream was very, you know, it's, there was humor. There was self-referential. Self, yeah, yeah. Self, yeah, all of that was going on. So changed, and so we're in production and, and everybody's like, oh, you know, scrambling. We've got to do it differently. We've got to be, you know, we've got to be funnier. We've got to be, you know, tongue in cheek. I didn't want to do that, and I fought it forever. And then finally I was like, screw it, I'll just, he screwed. And so I started playing along and writing some of the dialogue. But, uh, you know, it was fine. Was that one of your favorite franchises, like growing up? What, what, I mean, what are your favorite franchises Halloween, growing up? Halloween was my favorite growing oh. up. It's not, not that I, I didn't, uh, I mean, I watched all the Friday the 13th. I loved all the Friday oh. the 13th. But Halloween c- struck me as more real, and that scared me more. Yeah, You know, it's not... Uh, it's not the supernatural. It's not the vampires and the, that, that stuff never scared me. It was, you know, the guy who's across the street who could just snap one day. And right. that's what Halloween brought into my life. So, you know, I, I, people would ask, you know, what's your favorite movies? I, I don't have favorite movies, but I have movies that influenced me. And Jaws, Halloween, and Aliens were the movies that when I was growing up, those were the movies that made me what I am. You could probably throw Star Wars into that batch. But, Do you remember um, the first horror film, like the first one that scared you? Uh, Mad Max, believe mm. it or not, was the first one. Which you wouldn't call a horror film, but it was real and it it's it intense. freaked me out. Yeah, it's really I shouldn't. Intense. It was it was one of those free free HBO weekends back when they used to do that. Yeah, and uh, and it was on one night. My parents were asleep, and I had no business watching. <laughs> yeah, I, I have yeah. vague memories of Road Warrior on HBO, and and the imagery in that kind of scared me. Mm-hmm. So, masks. There's yeah, a lot of yeah. masks and yeah. steel and yeah. Yeah, it was definitely Mad Max because I wasn't allowed to watch the the horror stuff. I mean, I remember when The Godfather was playing on television. You know, my mom suddenly stood up because she knew <laughs> the horse head was coming. I wasn't allowed to watch it. Wow. And um, they were very protective of that stuff, but uh, they let Mad, Mad Max slip through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was fun. what was the uh, where were you at in your career when when Jason X happened? Like, what what was the kind of 
what was the path to get there? I, like, did you always want to be a writer? Was that specifically what you set out to do in terms of, you know, film work? Yeah, I wanted to write novels. So I just didn't have the patience for it. <laughs> and then a friend of a friend had introduced me to a guy named Dean Laurie, and Dean Laurie had written Jason Goes to Hell. Mm -hmm. So he had moved on, and he had written, I think, Major Pain was his, you know, latest film. And uh, so we bantered back and forth and talked about ideas, and he was like, look, if you want to do this, I was in Texas at the time. He said, you got to move out. So I did. He introduced me to Sean, and within... When I got out here within probably a month, I was I was working for Cunningham, working out of the maid's room in a rocking chair in a little desk and just writing. At the time, Sean didn't want to do horror. He was embarrassed by it and he didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, he's embraced it now. But uh, at the time, he wanted to, you know, he wanted to win an Oscar. And so we were he had me writing about, you know, delinquent kids and Spanish Harlem and, mm. you know, courtroom dramas. And I was like, dude, I'm a, I'm a moron from Kentucky. Let me write horror. <laughs> Good at that, <laughs> and uh, eventually, you know, Freddy Freddy versus Jason was just it's like Freddy, it, was it was in, like 10 it was years in development hell. Yeah, and he said, "You know what? Let's just go make another Jason movie." What would have happened in your Freddy versus Jason, uh, or or what would the tone have been? Because the tone in the final film was kind of silly, kind of comic, but kind of my. Uh, I always felt it was an event movie. It was Godzilla versus King Kong. Yeah, and uh, we had. Uh, we had an interesting storyline about uh, um, these. Uh, there was a drug that that would uh, enable you to enter dreams. Mm. I think man, it's been so long since I remember. <laughs> but I, I know that that these these kids, because Freddie was killing these kids off one by one, and so they got Jason and injected him and sent Jason mm. into Freddie's world. I think that's sort of how it worked. But it was, you know, it was. It was. I just green let that shit retroactively. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds sounds like uh, Robocop too. Yeah, that, <laughs> but that was that wasn't just me. That was based on Sign Ethan's draft. Sign Ethan did uh, Bulletproof Monk, and mm -hmm. uh, I forget all, everything else they've done. But uh, so you had you had sort of a criteria going into Freddy versus Jason. I'm like, yeah, oh, well, I mean, well, this is know, what we like. Can you continue that? I, I was getting paid, you know, uh, two thousand bucks a month to write for Sean and write whatever Sean wanted. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Them's the big bucks, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, Sean comes to me and says, look, this is what I want. Then that's what you want. Now, a lot of times I would deviate and do my own thing. Right. But, you know, it was his money and his, you know, so I did what I was told. Wow. And no one ever read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember the the whole release of Jason X being quite a, a, you know, it was finished for a long time and then it didn't come out. The, yeah. I, I told you this before uh, personally, but I saw it way, way in advance because yeah, I, I had a you videotape that. of it. And I mean, yeah. I made an event. I invited like all these kids over yeah, and watched yeah, it in my apartment or whatever. Because at that point, there was just no, you had no idea if it was ever yeah. going to come out. I mean, it got weird because DeLuca left. And DeLuca was, you know, he was the champion at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because DeLuca then later came back and, and produced Drive Angry. So I was like, you know, it's <laughs> funny because you, you greenlit my first movie and now we're working together. Yeah. But um yeah, it was a, it was a weird time because as far as I was concerned, I'm like, I finally made it. I finally got a movie made, and it's never going to come out. Yeah, no one's ever going to see it. I mean, I couldn't get an agent. You know, I had written a movie. I couldn't get an agent. The the movie was about to come out. I still couldn't get an agent. It was it was a weird time. Yeah, because you know, you come out here and you think everybody's going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya, and it's all going to you know we're all going to get along. Yeah, it's not like that at all. Yeah, you're sort of on your own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> So what did the release? So so it did finally get a release, mm -hmm. and it didn't do as well as oh, no, no, as no. anyone anticipated or oh, hoped. Oh, it did! It did way worse than anyone anticipated. Or hoped. <laughs> so, do you think it could have done better had it come out when it was uh, yeah, like straight yeah, away? Yeah, like if I they'd mean, released it at the original negative time. For us? I, Maybe I, I think a little bit because at that point it was one of those. I mean, thankfully the internet wasn't what it is now. Because had that happened now, it would have been. But still, it everywhere. But still, but it know, was the, at Fango conventions. Like mm -hmm. dealers were selling it, you know, VHS of it on. But marketing on the was changing then too, because mark, you know, they marketed Uber Jason. They weren't supposed to do yeah, that. Yeah, that was I your mean, surprise was in the movie. To be a surprise, you're supposed oh, to think you're going to see a Jason movie, and then you know, seventy minutes into it, suddenly he gets killed, and he comes back as sort of, you know, I mean, the idea was that he comes. I always had this image. Did you see the uh, uh, Stallone movie? Uh, I think it's Judge Dredd, where he fights this sort of cybernetic guy in the, you know, he's you know half this, it's just all dirty and corroded. That's what my vision for it always was. Right. It was in my head. And then you get the guy who designed Robocop, so you just go with that. 
And, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, that was supposed to be a surprise, and I thought it would have been a good surprise. And they put it on the poster. They put it in the trailer. I, that's the thing. I'm not writing surprises anymore. It's the same thing with, with Drive Angry. He bust out of hell. You're not you supposed know, so. to know that. The whole <laughs> script. We Read never said that. That's not once in yeah. the script did we ever say he, he came out of hell. Mm-hmm. No, never. Huh. You just sort of assume it. We let the audience be smart. No, no, no. Trailer guys, he broke out of hell. Yeah. <laughs> Give it okay, away right thanks. there. I so, quit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so how, how did that affect you when, when Jason X came out and didn't do well? Like, what was, what was kind of your next step to well, get to the next project? I was, you know, I had a bunch of friends, a bunch of screenwriting friends, and, and a bunch of us went to, uh, it was a combination of screenwriters and strippers, and we all went to, uh, uh, <laughs> Universal uh, to, uh, you know, Universal City, City, City Walk. Uh, City Walk. And, um, and we went in and we were the only ones there. It was just one row. Which, and for those of you who don't know, it's like a giant mall a in the middle of Universal you know, Studios. And, um, and I was like, wow, this is uh, not what I... Because back then, I mean, I guess you could get the numbers. I guess you could follow the tracking, but I didn't know anything about it. So I, uh, you know, I knew that the movie had be- had gone a little more tongue in cheek than I would have liked. I wanted it to be sort of a dark, scary, gritty kind of thing, and I wanted all the characters to play real, not necessarily be, you know, tongue in cheek. Nowadays, I look back at it and I'm like, I love it, but it, you know, I didn't then because it's my first movie, so I didn't know any better. But um, yeah, I figured I'd I'd never work again, as it oh. turns out. But I had written the thing is in preparation. I had so much time waiting on the movie to come out. I had written a, a spec. And it was actually a pretty decent spec. And so I had just got an agent. I had just, you know, made that problem. But it all happened because of the spec that I wrote. Uh-huh. And so I ended up selling the spec and had to director attached and all that. So things were happening, but it had nothing to do with, with Jason X. Uh-huh. What so, about all those scripts that you did while you were with Sean? Like, he owns all of that. He owns all of them. Yeah. So there's a dozen or so scripts yeah. that you wrote. Yeah, and when Jason X came out, I, I thought I was going to get this huge bonus. And then I read the fine print in the contract, to, which realized that he gets paid back everything he had paid me in salary as well as interest. <laughs> <laughs> and so I made nothing. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> wow. But, and, uh, and he owned everything that I, I wrote, so many things for him, and he, he owns all of that. I mm-hmm. don't it. Anything you could imagine him getting made? No. Okay. No, it was all stuff that uh, it was his trying to break out of horror right. for the most mm-hmm. part. You know, there were a couple of interesting things, but... Uh, no, none of it will. Uh, mm-hmm. None of it will ever get made. Well, when I heard you on on Adam's show on the movie Crypt, uh, one of the things you talked about, and I don't, I don't know if it was that at that stage that you had the spec, but you pretty much just kept writing and writing. So you had an arsenal of scripts. Mm-hmm. You had tons of ideas, and you know, not like one or two. Like I can't remember the number, but it was it was astronomical. Where I was like, wow, he's got that many scripts on yeah, his show. Yeah, it, but you know, the thing is, you I go back and I look at those scripts and I'm like. Ugh. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to touch them now because they really are a part of the process. And, you know, Stephen King says he writes every day except for, what, three days, his birthday, Christmas, and one other day. <laughs> that's that's how I you write. I believe it. He's you, got like two more books coming yeah. out this year. Yeah. <laughs> you write all the time. And if you do that, you can't, you know, I don't think you can learn how to write. I don't think it can be taught. I think you're born with some little gift and either you make that better or you don't. But I don't think it's something that you can take, you know, McKee's class and figure it out. It's mm-hmm. just, it's... I take McKee's class, and by day two, or by the end of day one, I'm like, okay, I, I kind of do a lot of this stuff. There's some great ideas here, and, you know, I didn't know that, and I didn't know that. But, you know, for the rest, I kind of automatically do this stuff. I, I, I want to go home. I'm, <laughs> I'm ADD. Let me go. But um, I don't know. Yeah. This is speaking to me, by the way. Eat, eat the chocolate. <laughs> eat the chocolate <laughs> marshmallow. I understand. Uh, hey, what, yeah, you had David Cronenberg read your dialogue. That's pretty fun. That is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That was a fun inclusion. I, I had David Cronenberg rewrite my dialogue. <laughs> How did he end up there? Was it because the director was an FX guy? Mm-hmm. Edward because Cronen? Jimmy was his FX guy. Okay. Oh, wow. I was wondering about how he got yeah. on there. Yeah. And you know, he like all that stuff. You know, I don't want him. I don't want him dead. I want him soft. That's all Cronenberg. Yeah. I, I, oh, that's, I, that okay. sounds like it's yeah. 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 What do you do sure. when Cronenberg's like, you know what? I'm going to change. You go right ahead. Do you, yeah. need, do you need a coffee? You need a, would you like me to get on my hands and knees and you sit on my back yeah. while you do it? What a Jason do Body Horror would have been fun. A yeah, Cronenberg, yeah. Jason Body Horror. <laughs> that could have been a good film. Now, how did you come to um, the most famous scene, the head and liquid nitrogen? That was, uh, I wish I could take credit. That's Sean Cunningham's son called me. I was in the hotel at uh, in uh, Toronto. And uh, he, uh, Noel, Sean's son, called and said, uh, you you got to figure out how to how to do something with liquid nitrogen. 
And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, freeze somebody, freeze their head, freeze something. I was like, okay, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, that's one of the things that Dean Reisner, who, Dirty Harry High Plains director, he used to say, look, you know, great screenwriters, they steal from the best. Mm. And so, you know, I'll take, uh, I have no ego. I never did when it came to this business. You know, I'll hear an idea. A lot of guys, you'll tell them a good idea, and you see them resisting it. I'm like, are you a moron? This is a great idea. Mm. I don't do that. You guys tell me a good idea, I'll write it. I got no problem with it. Who cares? It's about making the best story you can make. Mm-hmm. And you take elements from everybody. Yeah. That's what a crew, cast and crew is about. You it's get not- on set, people change your dialogue. Of course. Actors need to make it their own. Yeah. Don't get all huffy puffy if you're a writer. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of the, the director, Jim Isaac, um, and Sean Cunningham, <laughs> one of the things I forgot to mention before, the movie that I just revisited this weekend is The Horror Show. Which, uh, the Sean, electric chair one, yes, okay, it came out around the same time as Shocker. Yeah, Sean produced it, yep. Jim Isaacs directed it, yep. Scream Factory just put it out. Have you no, seen this? No, I haven't seen it. It's pretty, didn't it's, they also call one of the house sequels? Yeah, the house house three. Yeah, house house three. Oh, it is house three, yeah. then I might yeah. have seen it. Yeah. I, like, I yeah. am so fascinated like, by this. What? Yeah, yeah. House like, three. like I, I want to talk to Sean about it and understand how did this become house I three? I thought it had a Kiwi the director, show. the guy made, um. Was he no, fired? Well, uh, yeah, I think yeah. somebody was on it Because Jim was brought in. I don't know the story, yeah, David but Jim was Blay brought in. Yeah, David was his name, because I always grew up with his films in New Zealand, and he's pretty extreme. I was surprised he was making a, a mainstream kind of No, no, no. It, 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 a few days on it, and, okay. then, and then Jim Isaac was the one that finished it. Mm-hmm. It might have been his first movie, if I'm not mistaken, as a director. I believe it was, yeah. Yeah. As Interesting. Director, yeah. But uh, it's a really wacky, you know, hmm. serial killer in a chair kind of thing, but Screen Factory did a great job with it, mm-hmm. as usual, and it just... Because one of the screenwriting credits is Alan Smithy and somebody. <laughs> so yeah. you, you see that awesome. one guy became an Alan Smithy. So you, you see that at the beginning, you're like, oh man, that's great. I haven't seen it since I was a teenager, so I was like, what am I in for? Lance that's Hendrickson really is the funny. lead. Oh, that, okay, yeah, I know. He's great talking. in it. Yeah. yeah, but you get dialogue like like he finds a guy that's got his arm cut off, and he's like. He's like, oh, I tried, but he got me. And he's like, don't worry, man. I'm going to nail his ass. I'm going to nail him in the ass. And you're like, wait, what did Lance Hendricks just say? A lot of people are talking about nailing asses in this movie. That's funny. Very odd. But uh, but yeah, I don't know. I like the horror show. That's a good one. Um, any stories about Jim Isaac since uh, that you know he directed your first movie? And yeah, sadly, we, uh, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. He was always unbelievably supportive. And uh, and he did this, he did this great thing that... Uh, he and uh, David Hammond, who edited the movie, I would get, I, this is my first movie. So Sean would come in and Sean would come in to, you know, everybody on a set with any power is going to try to do everything they can do to make it the best movie they can make. And you may disagree. Uh-huh. And Sean was my boss and I was from Kentucky. <laughs> so I would fight and I would fight a lot. And at the same time, years later, you know, I had guys that I was working with, Jonathan Hensley and Dean Reisner and, and Dean Laurie, all these guys were saying, you know, your name's on the script, so you you have to fight. You have to go, you're big, you're, you're, you can be ominous, use that. Go in and scare the shit out of them. Can you say shit? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Say go in, <laughs> scare them, and, and, and you know, and, and get your huh. way because it's your name on the script. Well, the business changed, so I'll come back to that. But at the time, I was arguing with Sean left and right, and and, you know, we were... We fought a lot. And I remember Jimmy pulling me aside saying, just stop. It doesn't matter. We'll do what we have to do now, but I'm shooting what I need. And when we get into the editing room, I will have the movie that I need. Mm. Nice. I was like, okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> because I was seeing all of this dialogue. Like there was a scene where they bring this, this girl back to life from, from old earth. And, uh, and it was like, it was like watching the worst episode of ER because mm. there was just all this medical jargon, and it's, it was a 10-page ten, ten scene. Mm. I didn't write it, and we shot it, and I was freaking out over it. And Jimmy's like, it doesn't matter. Yes, we can shoot this all day long. It's <laughs> never going to be in the movie. That's great, yeah. That's cool. Like, so okay. always befriend the director as yeah. much as humanly possible. Yeah. And Jimmy and I were going to work together a lot, and then we just, you know, he was, I think he was living up north for a while, and then he was living down south, and we just... We just sort of, you know, it's like high school. We just, you know, we went off to college and didn't talk that much anymore. Yeah. So I didn't know he was sick. I didn't know. I, I knew nothing. I think I saw it on Twitter. Yeah. So. That's terrible. I met him yeah. once for, uh, I think he did a Fango Con for Skinwalkers. He did. He was yeah. promoting that one. Super nice. I yeah. yeah Stan Winston X. was there with him. Yeah, that's true. I met I both would go, of them together. 
I, uh, he, um, I think, uh, what was Pig Hunt he did? Pig Hunt was, yeah. That the, was the, the Shanger film that. as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I saw him uh, I saw him at Comic-Con when he was doing Skinwalkers, and then I, I went to the premiere of uh, the, the Pig Hunt at the Egyptian, I think. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, beyond us being buddies and pals like we used to be, you know, we just, we just went different ways. Yeah, and, uh, well, it happens in this business. Yeah, it does. I got a uh, question about 3D and before, uh, just in general, because what well, you we, mean that thing we were supposed to be talking? No, about? no, no, yeah, not in general. Thing. I have a list. It's, it's, no, it's more it's about it. writing it because I've never, I, yeah, it's that's... never crossed my brain until today to even ask this question. But uh, if you knew in advance that you're writing a 3D, I assume you did with my mm-hmm. bloody. Yeah. Uh, in the actual description, because you know, part of writing is just trying to make these people these people in offices see what you're seeing. Yeah. yeah. How different is the the kind of the description and the flourishes to get? the third dimension. <laughs> yeah, because I, I was never noticing when I made my list that the ones I listed my worst too, and they're the ones that were not intended to be 3D that were just kind of thrown in in post. So I assume yeah. that there's something special you have to do in the script. Well, oddly enough, for, for My Bloody Valentine, we did nothing special mm. at first because we didn't know. Mm. We didn't know what 3D was. We didn't know what today's 3D was. We mm. didn't. There's a, there's a scene in the movie where, where Jamie King and uh, uh, Boone, I forget her first name, uh, the the miners breaking through a wall, and there's a moment where where there's a hole in the door, and you can see the depth into this other room, and it's the kind of thing you know. Oh, we, we grew up, you know, uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Three. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we grew up with you know things poking at you, yes, as opposed we, to you know depth. something coming out of the Yo-yos, screen, and, and yeah. everything else is just blurry and gives you a headache. Suddenly, we were dealing with something, and we didn't know that until we started seeing the footage, and. Um, and and you, we could see the footage on set because we had the you know we had the 3D cameras and the 3D oh, cool. playback, so we we knew what it was looking like there. So we were changing constantly and rewriting and doing a lot of the deaths. I didn't come up with; they came up with while Patrick and and Gary Tinnicliff and Brian Pearson, the the uh, cinematographer, these guys would come up with it on set because they could tell you know they would go into a certain setting and the, and they were like you know this would be good or an actor would say you know what I'm going to put the 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 gun right in the gun barrel right in your camera. And uh, later when we got to Drive Angry, we knew. So by then we were writing for 3D. You know, we'll do this because it'll look great in 3D. And, you know, and, and then we start shooting stuff and, you know, the producers were like, you know, why are there no cars driving into the camera? And we were like, because you'll destroy the camera. <laughs> <laughs> because most 3D and anything that comes out of the screen at you, it's CG. Because you can't do it real, otherwise you break the camera. Right. That's yeah. sort of the, a lot of people don't know that, but that's actually the truth. That's how it, that's how it breaks through into the audience is because it's not really breaking through the camera. You have to create that. Mm-hmm. And, um, but what we didn't expect was the depth. What we didn't expect is suddenly you're inside the movie with them. And that was kind of nice. Yeah. And, uh, but since then we've written, you know, you write for 3d and it's, it's, but the actual description, like your actual writing style is actually different. In uh, in drive recording. angry. Absolutely. Oh, cool. In drive angry. We, we knew the moments where we were coming out of the screen. We knew the moments mm-hmm. when we would we would be utilizing the depth. Um, there's a there's sequences in Drive Angry where there's stalking sequences that we knew we would be using. Not necessarily things flying at your face, but it would be about you know being secluded or being claustrophobic or being things that we could create because we knew how the 3D worked at that point. We didn't know that with with uh, Bloody Valentine. Valentine was, you know, it was. So, you know, I've, I've seen people say, you know, the movie doesn't work without 3D. Well, screw them. The movie works great without 3D. It's, it's a whodunit, and it's a good whodunit. But, um, but I might be biased. <laughs> but the 3D is really good. It does. Def- that's one of the first films in a long time where 3D finally worked for we, the death scenes. You well, know, we, were the, we were the first. I mean, some people would debate this, but we were the first live-action 3D. There was uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, which had some live action, but mostly CG. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we didn't get to stay in the theater very long. We were... We, uh, we made a ton of money for Lionsgate, but we had to be out for Coraline because at the time there were no theaters. Oh, yeah, they weird. weren't set up so for 3D at the time. Yeah. We weren't, you know, it's it. We didn't get the the same run. Yeah, we didn't get the same huh. opportunities that a lot of the the later movies that came out got. Yeah, I remember when My Bloody Valentine 3D came out. Um, I, I I don't remember the last 3D movie before that. It seemed like there was a big. Gap. Like Gap. Beta Wolf was pretty close. Oh, that's Maybe true. Maybe that yeah, was yeah. like a year apart. Yeah, but, I want to say, but that was that was like fully animated. Yeah, for yeah the very most different. Part. Yeah, that so, was you know, animation's thing. different. But in terms of live action, that was the first one in a long time that I remember being like, "Oh, it's a, a 3D movie." Where was Final Destination Four in after. that? I feel way like it was after. after. Yeah, yeah, way after. And the thing that I noted about it um, from my 3D experiences was 
it, it was the first one that made me aware of depth like that mm-hmm. like you feel like oh wow you could really see all the way in there like that you know what i mean like whereas yeah. the idea of 3d is usually hokey and like something's coming at you whatever but that was the first one I was like oh wow like i feel like i could run <laughs> right yeah. into that you know that that cave and you know yeah. keep going or whatever so i remember that and and i enjoyed the experience theatrically However, and I've told these guys a million times, and I'm going to bring it up later again, and I've told you, I love having a 3D setup at home now. Like, 3D TVs now are fantastic. And it's one of, I, I think you were one of the people I showed it to, it's one of the first things I show people is the opening five minutes of My Bloody Valentine. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I'm like, because it looks better than I remember in the tears. Like, look at them going to the It could be the glasses are better now. Because remember, the glasses yeah. keep changing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes yeah. they're really dark. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, yeah. They're, Avatar had weird dark yeah that's true yeah yeah, it's crazy plus i I always argue the bulb issue like sometimes theaters need to have a bright bulb for the 3d to work as well Mm. theatrically but if you're watching it on a tv at home it's like the light never changes it's always the same i brought you the gift of drive angry uh, blu-ray 3d oh nice but i left it in the kitchen when i poured my rum (laughs) (laughs) so you'll have to get it next time fine (laughs) fair enough i remembered the rum though that's true. That's true. It's funny you mentioned uh, Final Destination because they were actually shooting it at the same time that we were shooting Valentine. It came out a lot uh, much later. Yeah. But uh, different 3D crews, uh, 3D crews were at each other because different styles and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, we were like, as far as we were concerned, we felt like this is great because, you know, we didn't want to be alone. We didn't want to be the only guys doing a 3D movie. So we were really excited that. Not only were we doing a 3D movie, but there was another horror movie coming out. It was 3D. So we felt like... Your start of a trend kind of. Yeah, we felt like we we were all a part of the team. And then Craig Perry goes on some magazine and starts dissing how dumb we are. (laughs) So later I I called him out on Facebook. And so (laughs) now... You don't have to worry. He doesn't listen to the show. (laughs) (laughs) No, I did. Plastic spoon head. Later, later he he sent me something on Facebook. He was like, he was like, dude, you know, really great opening. We're so proud of you. And I was like, dude, I read your article. You were a dick. (laughs) And he was like, oh, you know, it was just, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's like the talk that you have on the the sports team, man. It's just, you know, right, friendly ribbing. (laughs) Well, he has since come out on on Final Destination Four being. a, a bit of a mess. Yeah, that, that's really? what. Which it is. Yeah, the I fourth mean, one is totally. I thought I always liked it. Still, it was still fun. But I'm such You're a, a crazy huge fan. Person. But <laughs> that's like my favorite franchise ever. I've said this before. I know yeah, yeah. that that's definitely my like. Wait, was the last do... one? The fifth, the fifth, fifth one no, the is fifth awesome. One. No, 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 the fifth one's fifth awesome. But was it 3D? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, it totally. Was. That it one was really great. Select theaters. I remember. That's the one with the opening scene on the bridge. That's yeah, it's the one that goes back and kind of loops the whole thing. But the fourth one was the one that opened with the racetrack. Right, that's right. You like that? It's a good gag. It's a good gag, but the rest of the movies, you know, we. Uh, I mean, they didn't even finish the name. Like, there's characters at the end that are like racist. Like, that's the name. <laughs> they didn't even give the characters names because they're like, well, who gives a shit? Oh, uh, I just sure. I love the whole series. Was it all? Did, did Reddick do the the original? Yeah, yeah, he wrote yeah, the original. Yeah. yeah, because I kn- I told him this before, and I think we we argued about it, even though it's the script. <laughs> but I, I read a script at Cunningham's because Cunningham was thinking about optioning it. This was way back in the day, and they were adults. Mm. There were no kids. It, it they been. were on an airplane, and they were adults. Yeah, it was originally called Flight 182. Mm-hmm. I remember even reading about a new fango under that title. They gave out tote bags that said Flight 182 that looked like luggage bags. They now sell really? for But nice isn't that a eBay. very yeah. common note to get from studios? Like, you would write an adult drama, and then they're just like, I yeah, change it to teens. Make them I teens. Guess, it could have been a big sure switch. I asked him about it. He was like, no, it was always teens. Weird. I was like, are you lying to me? <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask Craig. That's yeah. funny. Yes. He'll set the record straight. Um, so what about, uh, why don't we talk about your relationship with Patrick? Because that, that you know, you guys mm-hmm. ended up working together quite a bit. Uh, did, did you meet him for the first time on My Bloody Valentine? No, I met him on Messengers. Patrick, Messengers, okay. after I did the first draft on Messengers, he was brought in to be the, the uh, director. Okay. And so I did another draft for Patrick, and then he and I were both fired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Stuart, I think Stuart Beatty was brought in, and he did a complete, no, well, no, no. He was Stuart. I was fired first, and Stuart was brought in, did a rewrite. Then Stuart was fired. Patrick was fired. Then it went into the turnaround, ended up somewhere else. But Patrick and I remained friends all these years. And so then he was doing work on, uh, on uh, he was doing secret work on a movie that we're not supposed to to talk about because neither one of us technically were working on the film, mm-hmm. so we can't tell you that it was called The Eye. But then <laughs> while he was while he was doing reshoots on it, he would. Uh, I talked to him, you know, because we would talk every now and then. He w- he was stressed, and he was like, this is not going well. And uh, he said, can I send you a scene? 
and just mm-hmm. get your ideas. And so he sent me the scene and I rewrote it. <laughs> and I sent it back and they shot it the next day. Oh, wow. And, uh, and we did that back and forth a little bit. And, but that was through Lionsgate. And so that's how I ended up getting uh, right. Valentine. And for those who don't know, he edited a bunch of Wes Craven's films yeah. before yeah. directing. Yeah. yeah, for a while, yeah. yeah. Most, all the Scream films, right? Yeah, all the Scream. All the Scream, Scream yeah. the Dracula ones, I mm-hmm. believe. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, Every, everything that, uh, all of Wes's best movies, if you look, Patrick Lucy is attached as, you know, Red Eye. Is it Red Eye? Red Eye's a Red good one, yeah. Red Eye's the one on the yeah. plane. Yeah. One. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all of the movies that, uh, that Wes, has, you know, Patrick would come in and, and, and same thing. thing for, and, and, and because of that, because of, you know, the screen movies, Patrick has also sort of became the Weinstein boy as well. So that's how we ended up with uh, Halloween. It wasn't because they loved me. They didn't love me. They loved Patrick. Right. But Halloween and Hellraiser and all that stuff, all that's through Patrick. Oh, man. Let's talk about those we, two we, franchises because well, like Hellraiser the is the one I'm always most excited to, mm-hmm. for somebody to reimagine. I just want to know how, because you're an intimidating guy. You're a sweetheart, but you're intimidating. And I want to know how intimidating it is to sit in a room mm. with the Weinsteins and pitch them a movie. I, I never <laughs> did. It was always over the phone. It was all, we never had to go to them. They never had to come to us. It was, we would get on the phone with them and say what we were doing. They wanted Drive Angry for for. Back in the back in the day, mm-hmm. and so um, we were set to shoot Drive Angry in January. Bob wanted to do Halloween before that, mm-hmm. so we we had the we had the script all worked out. I, I locked myself in the office and I wrote it in like I think it was seven days. While Patrick is hiring and and Gary Tunnicliffe's coming on, and we're we're in we're in post production. You're in the thick of it, and and two is still in two is still in theaters. Because I rem- what I remember was, you know, two was out for the Rob Zombies two was out mm-hmm. for like a month or so, and at the very end, I mean, there was some big screening. They they had a four K version of it, and they had the whole cast, and uh, Malika Khan was there and everything. Mm-hmm. And at the end in the Q and A, they'd already announced that no, the one scene says they're doing Halloween three, and he, even he was kind of surprised, like. Well, let's let's not get ahead of ourselves just yeah. yet. You know, we haven't really talked or announced that yet. But um, that's my memory of it. And at that point, I heard it was kind of full steam ahead. Yeah, and we were we were we were going strong. And then we turned the script in one day early. And I think if we hadn't done that, we would have been in trouble. <laughs> but um, what basically at the end of the day, there was not enough time to shoot that movie before we went into production on, on Drive Anger. And Drive Anger was our out. Yeah, and and Bob was basically like, if we go into production and it goes wrong, not only am I going to screw you over, I'm going to script your next movie too. And he said, I won't do it on purpose. <laughs> I love you, <laughs> but it's what's going to happen. <laughs> and so wow, we just man. did. So the idea was to come back after Drive Angry, and then go from there. And by the way, Malik through all of this, Malik was awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 the moment I met Malik, I adored him. He, he's, he, he was perfect. Yeah, but uh, then we came back after Drive Angry, and they said, "Yeah, what about that? Uh, let's let's look at uh, Hellraiser." <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, and you guys were on that for quite a while, right? Yeah, we uh, Hellraiser. We they wanted to do a remake, and we said, "No, no, we, you know, we're not. We, I mean, if you want to do a remake, you go to somebody else. We're not going to do a remake." Uh, we said, "We will tell a story that takes place in in that world, mm-hmm. but uh, because it's a very rich world there, we'll yeah. do that." And so we ended up. And I'll just tell it now. I think I've held it a secret too long, and now you know, it's not. <laughs> and he hasn't we, even had a drink of rum. Yeah. <laughs> when, we, when we went in and uh, and and sold it, it was basically the idea was we sold it by three three posters, and we said the first poster is Bill Fickner sitting in basically a throne, and he's you know there's light from above, and so he's casting shadows, and he's got a gun, got the gun sticking because it's going to be in 3D. And he's got three sixteen penny nails sticking out of his forehead, and little trickles of blood coming down. And up above it, it says the rabbit. Hmm. And then the next poster was, you know, the cube. And it says the hole. And then there was uh. a poster that combined the two, and it said, how far are you willing to go? And uh, oh. the whole idea was, and the way that we set the script up, is that we are telling, we're basically telling the story of Pinhead, how Pinhead became Pinhead. And it's, it's, a, it's a battle to save a daughter, and it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a father and daughter kind of thing, and then they're sort of at odds, but they love each other, and it's a whole this thing going on, and he's trying to get inside the world of the cube. And, and uh, by the end of the movie, you meet Pinhead, who is now the engineer, and it is years and years later, and it's Doug. It was going to be Doug Bradley. I mean, it was the whole thing. So you think you're, you're getting the origin story, but you, then you realize, oh, no, 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 this was never the origin story. Pinhead actually is down there and alive. Mm. And so it was... And so it was kind of an oh shit moment, and uh, we loved it. And uh, 
they read it and they loved it. And then they came back to us and said, can you make it younger? Uh, yeah. There's that note. Yep. The teens. <laughs> Actually, I said, I think it, it was a father and daughter. We started out as a husband and wife uh. that were at odds. And so we rewrote it as a father and daughter and gave her a bunch of friends. Hmm. And they loved it. This is it. This is the movie we want. This is perfect. We loved it. <laughs> but you know what? We love that final destination. That Craig Perry guy, he's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we ended up doing, uh, uh, we weren't going to do it. We said, no, we're not going to, we're not, you know, uh-huh. we're done. We're not doing this anymore. And everybody's like, look, just, just get it done. And so we did the final destination version. Which is what? Just like abrupt deaths out of nowhere? It was just all teenagers. Being and stalked was, by Cenobites. Uh, yeah. Using well, the box. Yeah, and the box. And, and look, we, we did the absolute best version of, of Final Destinations we could. And I think it was still it was pretty smart. But, uh, you know, what I wanted to tell was this. What know, stopped them from making this one then? Um, I have no idea. It's so uh, interesting. On this, on this one, we just, they, we just never heard from them again. Huh. There's huh. nothing. But, I mean, they go from, you know, it's it's... But that's how they were, because when we started out, they wanted a big, epic movie. That's why we gave them a big $40 million movie. Mm. Because at the time, I think it was Priest that was coming out. Priest Uh was this big, epic movie. Mm -hmm. And that's what they want. They're sort of whatever's going on. And then after that, Final Destination came out, and it was successful. And they're like, hey, we want Final Destination. So I don't know what the next thing was. Did you guys ever talk to Clive at all about it? Because I know a lot of people are always like, oh. No, I think Clive, and I could be wrong about this, I think Clive thought we were involved in the little crappy Keep the Franchise movie. Uh, Oh, the Mexican one. Or wherever they shot it. Because I I saw him, I think I saw him tweet or somebody told me he tweeted something. But no, we were, but the thing is we were never allowed to have conversation with, with, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, we always, every interview we did, we tried to say, look, you know, we're not trying to recreate what Clive Barker did. Clive Barker made this beautiful world. We don't want to remake it. Yeah, well, we and you this. can't because he's such a fetishistic guy. Yeah. You see that no. in that film. Yeah, you can't recreate that because no. that came from that guy. No, you know, it's it's, it's that's no his. It's, the truth is, it's his personal story. Yeah, you, you really, you can't do really that. Is. I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you want to throw out a whole, you know, threesomes and stuff like that, I'll, I'll go there for <laughs> you. But, the, but I, I can't. The fetish stuff I can't relate to. Neither yeah. could Patrick. Yeah. Now there's there's moments of that in the book, but it's literally me reading as an in books to figure out how to right. just understand, you know, what the the. You know what that is, as far you know, who has the power and who, who's the controller and all that kind of stuff. But it's inevitable that somebody's going to do Hellraiser, right? Somebody's yeah, gonna, it's going to come still, out. It's a I mean, the last I heard was that you know that that Clive was writing it again, yeah, or that we they brought rumors. him back into the fold somehow. But um, so is Halloween three D the version you guys were going to do, just on hold or dead for you oh, guys? It's, yeah, it's dead. It's that never, version, yeah, that version is dead because that version took place five minutes before Rob's movie ended. Oh, and so the first thirty minutes of that movie was actually the third act of Rob's movie. Okay. Huh. And so at the end of that third act, we killed Michael Myers. Oh, just wow. ki- killed the shit out of him. Wow. And so um, I think we sent him off of a uh, off of the top of a dam. He's tied into an ambulance, and he's on fire, and you see the mask melting to his face. And then later, you know, it's a year later, Laurie's in an institute, and you come to a, 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 a Halloween store, <laughs> and uh, they're stocking for Halloween. And this one kid says, "Hey, we, you know, they're pulling, out, pulling out, open all these old boxes, and like, we got this one mask left. Should we just toss it, or are we going to try to sell it?" And it's, it's the Jim T. Kirk mask. Mm-hmm. And then he turns, and you know, Michael's standing behind him, and he takes it and he puts it on, but you know, to cover this thing that's melted to his face now. And so he's become the monster. But then he becomes a shape, and for the rest of the movie, he's the shape, but he's in Tyler Mayne's body. Right. And and is he going anymore. back after Lori mm-hmm. in the hospital? But you're not sure if Laurie's changed or if she's a if she's with him or if she's not with him. And so it was it was great, and we did it to be contained and inside the most of it was inside the hospital. And Keeping was, the zombie mythology or 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 going back to the origins. The first thirty minutes was zombie mythology, uh-huh. and when we when you get when it goes to a year later, it's John Carpenter's The Shape. Wow, that nice. Sounds fun. I want yeah, to see that, would that have been movie. Cool. Nice. Plus, you guys would have probably squeezed Tom Atkins in there somewhere. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. See, Tom Atkinson. Yeah, Tom Atkinson. Yeah, Atkinson. He had a great day He's even too. better in 3D. Tom Atkinson <laughs> 3D is twice as good. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about that guy because he, when you guys brought him on to My Bloody Valentine and obviously Drive Angry, I was under the assumption he was retired at that point. Or, or he was. was he? He was. So how yeah. did you guys get him back out to do the movie? Because he lived in Pennsylvania. That's where we were shooting. Oh, and cool. uh, Patrick was a huge, huge fan of his. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, and his, he should be on our couples list because he and Jamie Lee Curtis were oh, yeah. a rem- remarkable couple. I agree. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, he was, dude, he he was perfect. He just, 
he's he's because in this in the script for Drive Angry, I wrote that Dumbledore dies on page five ninety six or whatever it was. You know that he shows up wearing the shirt, and we couldn't get it because of clearance. We couldn't get that shirt, which annoyed me forever. The day that he showed up on set, he's wearing that shirt. Oh, wow. He had found it somewhere, and he shows up wearing it. And he's and he's like, "What do you mean I can't wear it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't wear it in the movie." Sorry, that's awesome. I want you to, but that's how cool he is. He does that stuff. He's yeah, he's awesome. amazing. Um, what else? What else is on the list? Uh, was there anything else you worked on with with Patrick? Like, I, obviously, there was Fright Night for a while. Yeah, uh, you did, did a version of Fright Night, which yeah, did we did. Any a, we did that? a Tom Atkins, Jamie Lee version ver, version of Fright Night. A Tom what? Tom was, Atkins? Yeah, it was going to be. Uh, it was. It took place. It it was more a. I guess a sequel because. Um, yeah, I think it was more a sequel. I'd have to go back and look at. it. I think I put it online somewhere. It wasn't the same remake with like Charlie and. Charlie was in it, but it was completely because he goes. It's uh, Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis remade all of the the old Hammer film movies uh-huh. that uh, what's the uh, uh, Roddy McDowell's oh, character Vincent, yeah. had made the crypt thing yeah. he hosted. So they had so it was so we were sort of making statements about remakes and that sort of thing mm. as well. And so they're remaking all these movies, and Charlie comes to them because Roddy McDowell's dead. But you see Roddy McDowell's face like his actual fa- he's. You know, he was that character, and he's in the movie. And uh, so they come to, and so it's, it's there's similarities to mm-hmm. it, but it was a complete, but it was about, you know, this, this, this couple that, you know, this, uh, she was this tough vampire hunter, and he was her, her cop sidekick, and, mm-hmm. you know, they remade all of Roddy McNall's movies. Hmm. It sounds like it would have flown in the '80s for sure, but not not, not in the 2000s, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? No. <laughs> and Very so, uh, and that was Deluca uh, too, right? Because he, he ended up producing yeah, the Deluca. Uh, we we pitched it. Uh, Clint Culpepper had it at uh, where's he at? He's at Screen Gems. He had it, he had the rights first. We went and pitched it there, and he stopped us. You know, literally, we're two minutes into the pitch. He said, "You know what? I don't want to waste anybody's time. I know you guys all at the table get this, and it's probably going to make a great movie." I don't get it, and I really only want to make movies that I get. And so let's just, you know, let's be friends and, and let's call this an end. And I was right. like, all right, I'm ready to go. Let's go. Let's get <laughs> out of here. That's fine with me. And then DeLuca came back to us later, and he said, you know what? DreamWorks has it. Let's go over there. And hmm. so we did. We pitched it over there. By the way, we didn't get the job. Yeah. <laughs> the one that kills me uh, because it's, I just hate it. I, I really, you know, and I'm a huge Nick Cage fan too. I, I just really can't stand what they did to Ghost Rider because yeah, of too. all the Marvel, I have, you know, I have the first comics of that and it was a, that and what they, when they um, put him with Blade, mm-hmm. just copy what Blade did. <laughs> Go back to what the first Blade yeah. did. Yeah. They got it right. That tone with Ghost Rider would have been incredible. And they, it just was this weird comedy yeah, well, and it was a weird movie. It was like, a, it was like a PG and there was a weird thing where they're sitting with all the flowers, the romance. And you're like, what the fuck is this? Like uh, Dawson's Creek. And he's meant to be Ghost Rider, you know? And, then number two, I never even went to, to be perfectly honest, even though I liked the it's Crank movies. Bad. Yeah, I, I, I probably okay. I probably wouldn't it, mind it. But it, I was really curious when I read that you were an actual fan, I was like, oh, well, then I'm sure you would have had a very different yeah, take yeah. on that world. Yeah, and, and there was a time when I would take all those old scripts. I mean, I think it's up. I put it online. I know I did. I saw your yeah, blog I, about I gotta, it, but I didn't I got to double script. check because I'm sure that I downloaded I know it, all I, of them. <laughs> yeah, I know it. I know it's still there. But the entire, you know, and it's a very detailed, because when we would do pitches, we would we, we just figured, what the heck, we're just... We're going to show them what the movie we would do is. And we did. And at the end, you know, Avi came back and said, it, this is too violent. Yeah. And it was about, uh, and it was, it was violent. It was, uh, it was. But it should be like The Crow, right? It should be something like that. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I was, assume that they were trying to market it towards teens. Yeah, I mean, so you had to stay below the PG-13. This yeah. is Marvel right after Spider-Man and X-Men. Yeah. It's like they wanted, you know. They want kids. I assume. Yeah, but that comics never had that appeal. Yeah, the comic it, never hit that same target. Yeah. No, never did. It's a flaming so, skull on a motorcycle. Every seven-year-old boy in America wants it. So. Maybe, but it never showed. You well, know what I, mean? I mean, I don't know. We could, we could have toned. I mean, it wasn't like we toned it up when we told the story, but it was that. I think the idea was basically, it was a, a group of people who are hunting um, all of the ghost riders throughout the course of history, and so they're going and they're digging them up and they're taking the skulls. And as they take these skulls, Nick's Nick's character becomes less and less powerful. And so right. he, he couldn't make the full transformation. And part of our, our thing was, look, you know, you, you pay in Nick Cage, let's keep some Nick Cage right. in the movie. So you see some flame, but you still see Nick underneath. And, um, and so, you know, the more skulls they get, the weaker he gets until he's just, you know, sort of immortal trying to fight. 
to get his powers back. And uh, and the whole time, you know, they're trying to take his head off because they need the skulls. And Avi felt like it was too too violent. It's one of the few ex- examples where I would have cast young. Had I started the franchise, I would have mm-hmm. cast way younger to begin. Yeah. You know, a teen a teen character yeah. would have gone a lot further. It seems, but yeah, it's just I mean, that's one they they could probably redo it. They could reboot the thing with a very different vision. But you look at Blade and you look at the Crow and you're like, that's exactly between those two. It's exact mm-hmm. in Dark yeah. City somewhere in there. Yeah, I will a Ghost say Rider character. The best thing about the second one, which which I didn't like, but I will revisit it in 3D at some point. Um, there's like a little three or four minute featurette. I, I'm sure it's on YouTube and it's on the Blu-ray of everybody on the movie talking about the crank guys and how insane they are. So you, it's like, I'm on a motorcycle. And these crank guys two are is on, nuts. Yeah, crank two is a skates. nuts movie. And you see footage of them shooting the stunts and they're like on roller skates and like, you know, right behind. And you're like, these guys are That's absolutely cool. insane. So it does look cool. Mm-hmm. The I, second thing also on YouTube, obviously <laughs> Nick Cage actually played you know, he played Ghost Rider, and I guess he had, like, marks on his face, and they erased it to put the skull in the flames or whatever. Oh, nice. But he's got paint on his face. Like, it's, it's so he sort of looks skull-like. Somebody uploaded a video of all the footage from part two, but without <laughs> the CG. And I'm like, this movie's way cooler and scarier if it's, if it's just Nick Cage with face paint believing he's Ghost Rider. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't want to see this version of the movie. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. Yeah, I'd watch that. So, uh, all right, so 3D, let's talk 3D. Yeah, well, I want to know before we jump, what do you have coming up? Because there's some stuff listed on your IMDb Pro. Oh, yeah. I don't How know if I can that? talk about on I don't air. Know. What, what, what's on there? Heavenly I mean, can... Sword? Oh, yeah, Heavenly yeah. Sword. I did Heavenly Sword. Heavenly Sword was one of the movies that I wrote while I was writing Messengers 2 and Bloody Valentine. It's a CG movie, so it's, I think it was that old. And so it just, they just now finished it. And, uh, but I saw it about, I don't know, three months ago, and it's awesome. I, I loved it. I mean, when you the, say CG, you mean fully animated? Yeah. It's a, it, what, what the, the company was taking the video game a- assets mm-hmm. and then, you know, filling in the blanks of what, you know, so part of the story is told from, from the video game. And then what, where I elaborated, they have to fill in the blanks. And so it's a nice way of doing it. And um, so I've, I've done some, I'm doing some stuff with them right now. And, uh, we have that coming out. But, Why uh, does Halloween three linger on your UN Patrick's IMDb? Page? I think just people don't want it to die. Oh, okay, it, it, <laughs> it's dead. Has somebody else said they're making a Halloween three D or a, a different Halloween? No. Every every two or three months that comes back. Okay, is it on there now? No, yeah, it, it isn't. It, it, was or on it wasn't Patrick's on for Pro. sure. I downloaded your Pro this afternoon and it was not on there. Yeah, I wouldn't think that it it, it shouldn't be on there. I mean, they could. Uh, they could go do it, but they don't. They don't have to do it with us. The other one that is on there that is listed as announced is Zombie. Oh, yeah, that's... Can I talk about that one? Yeah. Okay, uh, Zombievers, you're doing Zomb- the Zombiever film. Oh Zombie fucador. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Some, I had. Uh, if if somebody comes to me and says, "Hey, we want to do a little movie," you know, and my, my friends are doing it, and you know, I, I'll say yes. For friends, and so I knew somebody who asked me if I would do it, and I said, "Yeah, yeah I'll do." It. Is this an but acting role, or it is an acting role? Yes, ah. and I, you know, and I read it. You know, it's the same thing. I, you know, like uh, Cheap Thrills. Uh, Evan asked me to come in and do. You're it excited to see that one. Yeah. I have, I've heard yeah. nothing but great things. It's, it's, yeah, it's fantastic, and uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, I it used to say I would only do, I would only act in things that I was doing for myself. But you know, it's a small town. We have, yeah, yeah. you know, I did some stuff. Hey, for, we cameoed in Holliston together in a, that music that's video. True. We got, forgot about that. The whole beautiful cum shot. <laughs> so, um, we did that, and uh, I did something. Oh, Andrew Cash had a thing I did for him, and so it's just you know. Oh, was that Thirst? Thirsty or not? Something else for the music video that no, Andrew just recent. finished. He uh, just finished a music video. It wasn't that. No, You're talking about that yeah. pitch film with yeah. uh, that he did with Skip. The Which, strip yeah. club one? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was good. Terrific. Awesome. I loved that yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. I, I was the bartender. That was okay. terrific. Yeah, so that one came out awesome. Um, so, you know, 3D, let's talk about our, our first experiences yep. with 3D. You, you you my first one it. didn't exist, and I found that out today. What do you mean your this first This is one of my most exist. disappointing moments <laughs> in my entire it? career. <laughs> no, this is not even a joke. I have the clearest, me- you know, movie miss memories when they mix with your life oh, and yeah. childhood. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have the clearest memory. <laughs> but for, I moved to New Zealand at about six, at about five and a half, six years old. I remember just clear as day seeing Krull in 3D. Never happened. As I, as I researched Krull today... I remember that film so well, and I remember it being in 3D. I remember wearing glasses, going to a theater, and seeing that thing fly at me. 
I looked it up, and no way and nowhere in the world did Krull ever play in 3D. And you know, my mind funny. was fucking blown If by you that. had asked me just now if I had seen Krull in 3D, yeah. I would have said, yeah, yeah, I saw it in 3D. I'm telling you, I really There's another so. movie, though. There has, there's it must another be another movie fantasy that, that was really similar. Were because one of the phantasms in 3D? Because it's got the same no. kind of should be. looking it should thing. Be. It should be, but it's yeah. not. Yeah. No. And that's something I want. I do want to talk about, why so many movies who arbitrarily use 3D... Mm. Just, yeah. you know, for useless reasons. And then there's these other movies where you're watching a movie and go, man, that film, Cube, in 3D, oh, would yeah. have been yeah. fucking oh, amazing. Been amazing. I, I, am, I am seeing a 3D movie in my head that's reminded me of... I, I don't a, know what it is. It's, it's got to be a fantasy, because unless, unless I'm wrong, unless it did play somewhere, but they didn't do post-conversion. It, it was a fantasy. Mm -hmm. It was a fantasy. It was, it was blue and red, red and green, red and exactly. green, whatever the it is. The old glasses... I, I'm telling you, if somebody could crack this for me, that would be huge because it's one of the strongest film memories I had in my life. Man, I can Laser Blast see, in 3D? I haven't seen Laser Blast, as far as I know. But Krull like, was one of those movies I saw so young and remembered it so well with the crazy... Um, I mean, no film would make more sense, right? I yeah. mean, look at it. Look at it's a, you know, the Blade thing. But uh, if anyone can crack that, I'd love to know. But yeah. no, I was thinking there's all these movies that, you know, obviously yeah. Inception, things like that. Uh, I, here's my quick... Inception should be in 3D, too. Yeah, it should have, yeah, but here's, here's ones that, like, imagine if these had been in 3D in, in the 80s. The Blob. There's a movie that would have been even better. It's awesome, oh, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, from Beyond, if those... Here's my thing about 3D. If it's the otherworldly stuff, mm -hmm. those sequences are going to fucking fly. Yeah. Uh, maybe not the scenes with scientists talking, but the uh, killer clowns from outer space. The, mm -hmm. the end of the Beyond. <laughs> imagine yeah. if Fulci's film ended in 3D, yeah. <laughs> and suddenly you're in this... Uh, and then the biggest one, which you've now just told me you guys were going to do, and I didn't know... Is Hellraiser. Uh, nothing makes more sense than Hellraiser's world opening up into 3D. So you're not necessarily wearing the glasses the whole right. time. But mm -hmm. when you do, and that's what I'm thinking. I think 3D, you know, the only scenes that don't work for me in um, uh, My Bloody Valentine, there's a couple, there may be two of them. It might be a Tom Atkins scene, is when they're just walking along, two people will be walking, and the background flattens out. Mm -hmm. It's just purely a technical thing. But it's like those are the parts where you think, yeah, it'd be better without glasses, you know yeah. what I mean? Where the depth is funky. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, with these movies where you open up a world, that's like, you know, gravity obviously wasn't really about the 3D as much as it was about just this world, but it was the first film I think I've ever seen in 3D, which totally made sense. Yeah. Like, I totally get what this yeah. is for, you know? And so I, I think my problem is when they're just arbitrary, like, you know, back in Friday 13th or anything where it's just about passing things mm -hmm. or the, the cheap scare. And I didn't yeah. think, I think Drive Angry is, you know, probably one of the closer action films I've ever seen to justifying the whole thing. Because again, it, he's from a different. He's coming from a different place. Yeah. Return. I, and and to be honest, the uh, slow motion, uh, having sex while shooting four <laughs> bad guys or however many bad yeah. guys is hard to repeat. I have a theory of what you saw instead of crawl. Okay, here I had we to go. Do some research to, mem theory. to remember it. Lucky I talked so long. Just Metal now. Storm. It could be Metal Storm. I, have, I, I don't know I that I've seen of. that, but you're right. It does look it's like got it. the same flying It's got a little fly. Yeah, you could be right. That's my guess. I had to look up the title because I year? remembered it. 1983. Yeah, I mean, that that I would have been contender. four to five we'll years to bring up the trailer. Old. But that looks Star wars -y and I don't right? recall having oh, seen it, but you never know. It's not really Star Wars-y. Is, um, Is it more? I got to see it. Yeah, I, yeah, I we'll haven't have seen to, it we'll since like 1983, but I don't remember it being really Star wars -y. I remember it being darker. Could they post-convert Crawl now into 3D? Yeah. If they, they had the money? They could post-convert anything. Could. Let's do that. <laughs> what do I mean? The truth is that's probably the future. Well, I've been saying that for yeah, years, but right. the, the future is eventually we're going to have Jaws in 3D. We're going to have... Yeah. We're yeah. not going to want them. And, right. people are, and right. the fanboys are going to bitch like crazy, but right. that's what's going to happen. E.T. will come out in 3D. Robocop and all that, yeah. Because the technology will catch up. Right now, we don't have the technology. The problem with 3D, you know, we, we, we always expected that because we came out, you know, Lions... Uh, Lionsgate at the time, they made some good money off of us, and, and we expected there would be a sequel. Mm. For for a, a string of reasons, we didn't get one. But um, all of these other movies, we, we we couldn't get a job, by the way, because people would say, "Oh, well, you know, it's that's a it's a fad, it's a fluke." Mm. You know, you got you know, three is not going to last. Yet every studio in the in the world were doing three D movies, and as a result, you had a bunch of this conversion stuff happening and it wasn't good yeah the yeah. conversions are really and uh, yeah. you know you had you know you craig and those guys were coming along with final destination and they were shooting in 3d yeah and you can tell the difference yeah. and then you have what was it uh, uh the clash of the titans comes out mm -hmm. yeah. and you can tell that's oh, yeah. conversion that yeah. was rough yeah. and and people spent their money and they went and they got pissed off mm -hmm. and uh but you know a lot of people made money yeah. a lot of studios made it but it also costs more 
to go to the it movies. Like you more. actually pay more for your yeah, ticket, you're, which is crazy. But yeah. think about the money that they've made just within the past years for doing conversions on Jurassic Park and right. re-releasing yeah. Titanic as 3D or um, Nightmare Before Christmas. They did the 3D release of that. Well, see, the, but those have like you know. They, like something like Clash of the Titans, it was there wasn't time. It, yeah. just, it was a last minute decision. Like, Still. let's see if we can make mm. more money by converting it yep. and get it out by that date that we wanted. Now regardless, you guys are stressing me out. You know, Jura- <laughs> sorry. <Are laughs> Jurassic like- Park was an example where they took the time and care. And quite frankly, Jurassic Park looks great. It it looks, Did you see it? It's, it's yeah. It's I, that's the other thing I show people when they come. I haven't over. seen that yet. I'd like to I see show that. them the Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's scene a little beautiful. We also can't ruin those downtown. movies because they already exist and we already love them. Yeah. So yeah. by doing Jaws, then who? cares i'll watch it in 3d and if i like it i like it you know and like but with something like my soul to take mm. i mean it was yeah, a bad movie was a... they knew that they were trying to save it so they put it in 3d but it had no business that is oh, that still was the delay my worst 3d yeah, movie it. ever yeah well especially because it's a talky film it's yeah. a lot of talking mm-hmm. you don't want to see talking in 3d i mean that really is the worst part of you know a 3d yeah. film yeah but anyway so my, my feeling in general i mean look, freddy's dead did i mean freddy's dead bothered me you know it's a pretty cool trippy scene now when you go back but it's a terrible fucking but movie but i hate that it's just that scene well, yeah that's like they, they and couldn't... i've told you that i was the dumb kid who wore them the whole time yeah and i looked I around that. and i was like going what the this is shitty like yeah. and i kept looking at other people around me <laughs> but that idiot. was my first 3d movie so yeah, it, it, probably was early it holds like a special place in my heart because it was the very first one i ever saw in 3d and i saw it at a drive-in mm-hmm. um because in my tiny little town we didn't even have like a full-size theater at that point we just had the drive-in so yeah it just holds such a special place for me because of that I'm sorry. My yeah. first, my, <laughs> I remember my very first 3D experience, and it, I mean, it, the memory of it is better than the actual thing, but uh, they were showing Creature of the Black Lagoon on regular network That's television, cool. and you mm-hmm. had to go to 7-Eleven to yeah. get special glasses for it mm-hmm. or whatever. And so awesome. how does that work? Because he, that's I was thinking about that. I remember seeing a couple on TV, but how does that work? I mean, because now you have a 3D TV, which is very different. How were they pulling that off on TV with well, those same glasses? The, it was the red and blue yeah. process, but, but it, it, yeah. hardly any of it was in 3D. Because yeah. I remember there was a moment where the the cre- I, I did the same thing. It was on TV. And yeah, I remember the creature swimming up work. from the depths, and, and if you had the glasses on, then it looked a little bit 3D for a moment, and then it was gone. Yeah, yeah. it didn't it did, uh, didn't look good at all. It no, was terrible. It was but that was my first thing, and you know I love the Universal Monster movies, and I was so excited about it. Um, but it wasn't it, honestly. And it's funny because the more I think about it, it's like Michael Jackson is always like the, the pivotal moment. It wasn't until I went to like Epcot Center and saw Captain mm-hmm. EO for the first mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. that I was like, "Holy shit, that's what 3D is supposed to look like." There's like you know nails coming at me and stuff and all sorts of crazy shit. So as a kid, that's what I remember. Yeah. Now in retrospect, I have rewatched the creature now in the new version. Yeah, they put it out you know, in theaters too lately. They, they put it out in theaters, and the version in the Universal box set is formatted for 3D oh, TVs. Cool. Oh, I it's beautiful. Well, because he swipes great. right at the camera. Swipes and, yeah. at the camera. There's a lot of depth in the water. Uh, really? You know, yeah, it's great. So uh, it was you, completely you, converted though, right? It was converted for the the modern glasses. The yeah. 3D TV. But it looks okay. great. Yeah. I mean, you know, you guys are all welcome to come over and we'll watch it. But uh, and, and I always tend to find the older movies are interesting watching them now on the modern setups because I have House of Wax, the Vincent Price one, which looks great. Um, by a director who could only see in two d <laughs> he could be blind in one I had no depth of perception, yeah, which I love to it's, it's interesting just seeing because older movies have a lot more grain to them, so that's the only slightly distracting thing uh. whereas like newer movies are just mm-hmm. because you know because it's digital, it just it looks perfect in the depth and everything, but House of Wax looks good, there's this great yo yo gag that's just amazing did they do yeah that's the start of the film did Dial they do flesh for, for frankenstein i don't know about that Paul one Di- dial in for murder is another one that's out now on three yeah that, that, that's that got a, some great, great sequences you know but um but yeah i mean i piranha I, 3d i thought for the modern one w- what i liked about it was the silliness like usually that's the opposite of what i look for in a movie but in that one it was just so unabashedly like no i'm gonna show you two naked girls romping underwater in 3d now and, it, and i totally <laughs> could appreciate them just going no we're that's not even so trying John to make Gulliger. Yeah, well, no, the first one, <laughs> the no, first the one. Oh, oh, the, the 3D, the, the second one, I yeah. can't, and I Which can't is funny comment because on. I will argue that I like the second one better than the first one because at least the Gulagers have a sense of humor, which Alex Aja definitely he does not. Th- I thought yeah. the first one was really funny. Yeah, he, I, he doesn't it think it's funny moments. though. So, I thought it was really funny. Are you guys talking about the first 3D movie you saw or first 3D in the theater? Both, both. Yeah, first 3D I saw was either House of Wax or Creature, but uh, well, we know we sort of crawl together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In Memphis, right? yeah, that's true. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I think first theater was probably Friday Thirteenth. Friday Thirteenth Three. You saw that one in theaters. Yeah, I saw that one in theaters. I can't remember what was before that. 
Was J- Jaws 3D was around that Jaws time too, 3D. right? Yeah. I remember seeing that on TV. I did see, I did see was Jaws before? I'm looking at it. That was another big TV one. Time. I remember but Jaws 3D Friday the 13th on TV. was always really good at ripping off whatever was going on. So my guess is Jaws was first. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. That would, if I had to guess. But uh, yeah, but Jaws, not necessarily better because no. they're both pretty. They're both pretty flawed. In Jaws that sense. had a couple of good scenes that yeah, were three D. I saw it in three D much much later. Yeah. But, but um, most of them were not. the like yeah. the Jaws <laughs> going very very slowly Slow towards the of, glass. And, and, I love that. And gliding to the side yes. without really swimming. And yeah, he, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. Like, <laughs> he doesn't even really. It's like but he hey, stops when he hits hey, the glass and then it shatters. Have you seen Dennis Quaid's uh, uh, six pack or eight pack? Six pack in oh, yeah. Uh, yeah in three D. Wow. Yeah and. Cool. Louis, who can argue with Louis Gossett Jr. and 3D, right? You know? I, I want them to put that out again. I, I heard somewhere that they did an HD transfer of it, so cool. I can only imagine they're going to put Jaws 3D out at some point. Um, Friday the Thirteenth Three was before Jaws really? 3D. Yeah. 1982 versus 1983. Hmm. Yeah, I believe wow. that. That's IMDb, which isn't but always right. Jaws but. 3D was probably announced first, and they just rushed. Yeah, That's, yeah let's true. get it done. The Mask, the one we watched, we watched that at Jump Cut oh, on yeah. 16 oh, mil. that was awesome. That film, without the 3D, the dream sequences are like this crazy Mario Bava stuff. Yeah. If that had been in 3D, those are the parts that, because yeah, it, it keeps, awesome. the gag is put the gla- the mask put on the now, mask which means put now. your glasses yeah. on. And it, those scenes would have been amazing if if I'd seen them in 3D. They I think reminded they me been of great. like Vorkapik, where, so, getting old here, okay. like he directed <laughs> all these trippy montages from the 20s and 30s, and they were very much like uh, him. Which just would have kicked ass. Yeah, no, I mean, look the, up your Vorka pick, people. I'll look up some Vorka pick. <laughs> I gotta, gotta work on that. <laughs> I'm dropping the ball. Um, but it, I, I don't know. I think it needs to either be like completely just for fun and abash it. This is fun. Like where the where a blade's coming right at you. There's da- a nude woman's dancing, swimming. Or it needs to be, or it should be used. Somebody should look at it and like, how can I use this to evoke a whole yeah. other world? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially in horror of all the genres. It's like, well, we always went into, we always felt like 3D was the, the roller coaster. We felt like it was. Was supposed to be fun. Cameron yeah. came in with a completely different logic behind right. it. I don't hate his logic because now that I've seen now that I'd seen what it could do, I understand that you can have a very voyeuristic, a very mm. interesting movie based on a 3D experience without and, and Cameron, you see, you go watch Avatar. There are moments when shit should be coming out of the screen and it ain't. Because yeah. he does he won't do it on purpose. Huh, interesting. And uh but he'll give you the depth. Yeah. And uh but yeah, I, the thing is, it's just like anything else. It's just like the amusement park. You know, I yeah. don't, I don't want to just ride the roller coaster. I, I want to ride the Cameron Avatar every now and then. Right. right you know, yeah, and yeah. I want to ride the Bloody Valentine, and I want to ride the Final Destination. I want it. You know, I want all the rides when I go. And so I don't. You know, the whole debate over 3D needs to be this or needs to be that. You know, I'm just happy that the cameras got smaller because right. yeah. you know, yeah. we we the cameras we started with on Valentine were they were the size of a refrigerator, and we were taking them down in a <laughs> mine. Where everybody had to duck because you know. Oh my god! Do you still need the two cameras, or is it just? No, you the still same? you still need to, for for each eye, okay, and, yeah. and they got smaller. But even in Drive Angry, people were like, "Why did you use the charger?" Well, because it had the biggest back seat. Mm. Because you got to get a big camera camera mm. in there, and uh, and we tried other cars, and the camera wouldn't fit, and so but the cameras keep getting smaller and smaller. But they are you know they they used to be side by side. Now they're they're like you know they're. And then you you separate it later, but uh, you know you still need the two eyes. It's it's basically you're creating a mechanical human that sees like a mechanical human sees, mm. so that we see 3D. I'm so annoyed now that there's no William Fichtner uh, Hellraiser movie. Oh after, my god, because he's so freaking good <laughs> that, and yeah. drive angry. Your description of that poster. Well, is just let's go yeah, back. Badass. Let's go back to talking about the the best horror film um, uh, couples, and I uh-huh. think it's a tie. I think it's 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 me and Betsy, me and Amber, and me and Fickner. <laughs> <laughs> a three-way tie. <laughs> but me and Fickner would maybe edge out to be, you know. Nice. Yeah, he's really great. <laughs> he is great. It's yeah. uh, I, The first day that I met him, I was uh, staked up to the wall because he's supposed to be, uh, you know, skewering me to a wall. And uh, I don't know if you guys know who Bill Fickner is, but you you know who he is. You just may not know the name for – but uh, he's been in every movie ever. Mm. And uh, Most of you have seen him in Prison Break. Prison Break, yeah. And uh, Armageddon and uh, – he was in the latest. Go. I remember he was Go. hilarious in Go. He's, he's awesome. so Go is Go. hilarious, those two characters. You just never saw that twist coming. The yeah. Dark Knight. He's at the beginning of that. Oh, yeah. Dark Knight. Yeah. He's the banker. Yeah. He's, he's, you know, he's very awesome. intense. He just keeps, keeps yeah. on moving. He has and that energy. It, but, you know, and even on set, he's an intense guy. And so he's kind of one of those guys that you feel like you need to just stay away from. And so, you know, I had just met him. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know, and he didn't care. And so I'm staked to the wall, and he's supposed to do this little little flourishy kind of move where he sort of pretends to stab me into the wall and he's and he had the real baseball bat 
And he said, I, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to hit him. And we had a, didn't have a lot of time. And I was always very conscientious of time and that sort of thing. And so he, he's going to do it. And Patrick's like, just do it. You'll be fine. Just just go to the right. You know, the camera's over here. You won't see anything. He's like, I'm, you know, I really would like to use the fake one. And Patrick was worried that the fake one looked fake. And I said, Bill, and I'm sort of, and you guys aren't going to be able to see this, but because I'm, you know, I'm hanging up on the wall. And so I'm, Bill, I'm just do it right here. And I'm flipping him off. As I'm, <laughs> I'm pointing with my dirty finger. I'm like, Bill, put it right here. And he did a double take and he's like, you just flipped me off. <laughs> and we've been best friends ever since. That's real good. That's well, awesome. not best friends because he works more, so I don't get to see him much. All right. <laughs> oh, he's Shredder in the new Teenage Mutant Ninja he is Turtle indeed. movie. Yeah. Oh, cool. I'm looking at his uh, list right now. Yeah, he is in everything, man. So of all the stuff you've written that hasn't come to fruition yet or the stuff you want to write and mm-hmm. is, is Halloween because you've, it was an early love, the one you would have liked to have seen get done or is there? Yeah. Yeah. Halloween. I mean, you know, Halloween's one of the movies that, you know, I'm not going to get to do a Jaws movie. I'm not going to get right. to do a, a alien movie, but Halloween, you know, that's one of the movies that made me what I am. So yeah, yeah I wanted to do a Halloween movie. And, and it was a good one. And, and we, you know, we weren't disrespectful to Rob at all. We, we gave him, that moment in his movie, we, we utilized Tyler as the T-Rex that he created. Uh-huh. And then we turned Tyler into the shape. And, uh, and, and it wasn't to make any political statements. It was just, that's the kind of movie that I grew up with. That's the kind of movie I want to see. Right. Um, I liked Rob's first movie. I liked it a lot. If I had any criticism, it would be that, you know, my biggest fear of Michael was that he could be the guy across the street. I didn't, I didn't want that demystified. I didn't want to know why. I didn't want those details, and uh, but that's not to say that you know I don't love it. Uh, you know, he's uh, Devil's Rejects is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, uh, that's great, and it's reasons. amazing that you guys. It almost seemed like your version of Halloween Three would have satisfied both camps: the people that like the Rob Zombie camp and the people that like the original mythology. Oh no, no, we'd still be hated, but still. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. satisfying. That's, yeah, that's I've true. Been, but it was there was an attempt, or at least trying to. You know, combine both worlds or whatever. You know, I did put Jason in space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got that going for me. Speaking of great movies, oh, sorry, that would have been 3D. Halloween 3 and 3D. That, the, the season of which, yeah, season with those witch. masks, how cool oh, could that have been? Yeah, with the worms. Yeah. I love Halloween 3. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, big that, fan. that's, huge you, fan. you watch that and you're like, what? You know, yeah. for the first time, I just do, want to do you watch remember when you were a kid watch it, watching but, it for the first time? I remember hating it like you couldn't believe. I was no. so upset. Yeah, I was so upset when the kids sitting in front mind. of the TV. I was like, yeah. Why, why, and now why? I watch it and go, this is so fun. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you can't do that. I don't think you can yeah. do that today. You can't yeah. plop a kid down and then send snakes and bugs out of his <laughs> yeah, probably not. eye holes. Not and get it made by a studio, at least. No, yeah. no way. You should try. So do you guys have other 3D films that like stood out as faves for you? I didn't see a lot of stuff in 3D. I mean, Krell's really? still the best I've seen, <laughs> and I ain't giving it up for wow. nothing. <laughs> I, I see. I'm one of these people. Like I always say, I could watch like Dave cook a grilled cheese in 3D, and uh-huh. I would be mesmerized by it. Um, so, like any time I get to see something in 3D, I'm Dave's always her dog there. for those who don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Not her husband. Um, so, like Prometheus for me, even though the yeah, movie nice, was right? okay, Pretty, yeah. the screening was amazing for me just because I was watching it in 3D. And even Beowulf, I talked about. I love um, Beowulf. I I went to the press screening for that and they did full IMAX 3D. Like it was yeah. everywhere. And again, I could love or hate the movie. It really doesn't matter. It was just an epic screening. Plus the Beowulf people gave out these really nice fur blankets to all the press. It was really cool. Um, but yeah, there's so just, easily bought. I, we are, <laughs> the there's just, there's a whole bunch or actually, um, it's not a horror film, but I saw Percy Jackson and the sea of monsters recently in 3d huh. and it wasn't, I had no idea about the Percy Jackson mythos. I'd never read any of the books. I was just like, fuck it's in 3d and i've got an afternoon let's go see it and i just loved it but um i have to say one of the best ones that i've ever had was at the new york city natural history museum i went to see one of their science films in 3d and it was like a sea monsters thing it was like yeah. sea. Wait, I those do tend to be the best things yeah. the, the uh, yeah, imax yeah. I've, stuff. I've seen are you yeah, sea I've monsters, seen the sea monster. A prehistoric adventure yeah, is I've what it's that. called. And it was like in full, like, you know, 30 foot tall IMAX and it wrapped all the way around my head. And it was the coolest yeah, thing I've ever was. seen. And I walked out. Why? Because I was there with a five-year-old and she was 
freaking out. She was like, in the middle of the movie, she's like, this movie is not good. <laughs> and so we had to leave. I took a date. To, I wasn't married at the time. And I remember I took a date and I was like, we're going to see prehistoric sea monsters. I think it was like two IMAX. years ago, right? It was 2007. I even, I looked really? up the date. It played oh, on the circuit. So I circuit. took my two year old to it. It played on the circuit for quite a while. It's Oops. not like the, the science movies aren't quite like our normal industry movies yeah, they where like yeah. they play for two months and then they're gone and we never hear from them again. They stick around for a while. So yeah. it could have been two years ago. It was still playing the circuits. Yeah, she's probably, probably I looked up young. the I, I looked I up love the that list. mentality, by the way, because like, because like Netflix Instant now offers 3D movies. If what? you have Wait, a TV. <gasps> oh, watch prehistoric TV. monsters you know, tonight. Thing, like my, my roommate and I were on the couch and we're like, oh, let's see what's on Netflix, and we'll find like, you want to watch this 3D oh. documentary about the ocean? There's another like, one yes. called Walking with Dinosaurs that kicks total ass. Yeah, that's I, like, on there, I, think. I had yeah. I had a season pass or what yeah. like a friends pass to the New York City Natural History Museum because yeah. my parents always bought me one for Christmas, so I got him free all the time and I got to see all the movies for free every single time they had a new science movie i saw it so um walking with dinosaurs also good wow yeah. i was surprised I, I read the list of films that were in 3d and the one that i just can't even believe was robot monster it said was remember the one with the the, the ape who has the skull well he hasn't even got the skull except on the poster he's got, he's got, the, got a little astronaut astro- hat. it's like oh, an, yeah. it's like a it looked like it's made for hat. yeah like for ten thousand dollars in the 60s or something yes. but it said i mean you don't know what kind of 3d it was mm-hmm. but i i can't imagine I mean, it can't have been a, that expensive because some of these super indie, almost Cor- Corman didn't do a lot of 3D, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. Almost none. I don't know if Corman well, actually made a 3D film. The, yeah, thing, that, the that. thing that annoys me most about today's 3D is that, you know, in the beginning, when we when we did Bloody Valentine, probably I was supposed to say this, but we did it for like $16 million. Uh, I don't remember what the 3D budget was, but it was mm-hmm. pretty pretty sub- pretty substantial in that. And... Um, because back then it was all pretty much new technology. And, mm-hmm. and that's why there are moments when things don't look exactly right. right because we're figuring out as we go. None of us had ever done a 3, 3D movie. But nowadays, the theaters jack the, the ticket prices mm-hmm. yeah. as a result of that. Well, you know what? It costs $20 million to get Johnny Depp. But you don't have to pay more when you go see right. a Johnny Depp movie. Right. So That's on it, their end, right? They should eat it. Yeah, and it doesn't cost $20 million to do a 3D movie. So... It just seems really dishonest. And I say this as a guy who, you know, I look, I helped start 3D and I helped kill it with Drive Angry. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, you know I, it just feels dishonest. It feels amazingly dishonest. I want 3D movies. I don't want every movie to be 3D, and I don't understand why i got to pay more for it. My feeling is with ticket prices that they should go even higher on those and then, and then subsidize it by making other movies lower. Like find a way to go, hey, that's 20 bucks to see 3D, but that's only six bucks to go see this other one that's a lower budget mm-hmm. and documentaries are $2. <laughs> and just find some way to change I, the way we be, pay for things. I would things. be for that. Yeah. I would be all for that. I know, so, I know there's bargain theaters, but I wish, I wish newer movies, like I, I wish it, the pricing would change like after it's been out for a while, if that makes any yeah, sense. That makes no sense. Some like after a movie comes out and it's been two or three weeks, I feel weird going to the arc light and paying, you know, fifteen, sixteen dollars for a movie that's been out for three weeks that everyone's yeah. already seen. That's I, why I don't know. I miss the drive in. Yeah. I, I wish we had more options like that. Yeah. The drive in's still here. I mean it's Well, uh, I I've got I a like drive it. to the one because there's the one that's the hour away, the tiki one that looks I haven't awesome. been to that one. I've been to the Vineland a lot and it's good. I mean it's it's never quite dark enough or something mm-hmm. the screen, but it's you know, you see two films for like Eight bucks. Yeah, that's how it was back home in Win- in my tiny little Virginia there's, town. Um, is it was five dollars a person, and you Vineland, would see two well, movies. Vineland uh, City of Industry. It's called. Yeah, it's oh. City of Industry. It's called it's about Vineland Drive. Five minutes out, so okay. which might be mm-hmm. worth the drive since I don't get to go to a theater anymore unless they get allow um, with people for eleven kids. months old. <laughs> that's the thing so. with people with kids. It's good and mm. suckers. But my question, since it's currently in theaters, has anybody seen Nurse Three D yet? We can't. Because it's freaking, I yeah, tried so hard this anywhere. weekend, it's not playing in LA. It's playing in Orange County only. Are you only. serious? Yes. Yeah. No, I was so I actually, pissed off this weekend when I, when I went to try to see it. My I mom got, is coming into town next week, and I was so excited because I finally no, we'll start have next week. a babysitter. We'll start and next then week. I, okay. This okay. Friday, I'm sure it will be in LA. You think I actually so? hear relatively good things. I heard about really it. Yeah. positive I stuff. I want to yeah. see it. I, if the VOD option is is 3D, then I might yeah, try I'm not to gonna watch it that way. I'd go to your house for that. Yeah, sure. They did the press screening at 9 a.m. in Beverly Hills on a Tuesday, and I was like, I would have to leave my house at like 7 a.m. to contest with traffic to make it to Nurse 3D's They press probably screening. don't think what they have is good, but the public are probably yeah. going to be like, this is really fun. This is like, you know. It's, it's gotten predominantly positive reviews in the sense that it's exactly what you think it is. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, you know, I, saw, I saw the poster 
And yeah. that's, that's all you that's, need. <laughs> that's Tim Palin. And Tim Palin was our marketing guy on on the Bloody Valentine. And so, you know, you see that poster and you're like, yeah. I kind of want to see that. I remember how good you are. (laughs) I'll I'll take that. No, I agree. I mean, I I was hoping we could have seen it by this weekend, but, you know, it wasn't out. So hopefully it comes out. I also want to say, by the way, uh, one of my favorite trailers is the first trailer for My Bloody Valentine 3D, which I don't know if it's on the DVD or Blu-ray, and I hope it's on, I'm sure it's on YouTube, but the original trailer sold it as like, the perfect date movie perfect in date 3D. Movie. And yeah. like, you know, it, it like got meta where you're in a theater and you, you know, oh, see the yeah, where he does the scan the explosion yeah. and everything. It's that. amazing. Cool, yeah. It's one of, yeah, I love that. That made me, well, when I've you got, were on the fence about it, if you saw that trailer, you're like, I'm going to see that. Yeah. So this one kind of perplexed one. me when I was researching recent um, 3D movies, I saw Silent Hill was listed. The, the second the one. The second yeah. one was Did 3D. Did that one ever make it to yeah, yeah. DVD? Yeah. Oh, it's I don't Ellie. know about DVD. I saw that in theaters. Came out, didn't, you, yeah, the 3D was actually see, great. It, the film was just... Movie. Cool. I loved yeah. the first yeah. one. So, and, yeah, the first one's a better movie. I never even paid yeah. attention to the second one coming out, which may have been the problem. Came and went. So, it had like out. ash falling around you that literally... It was more like gravity. I felt it was the closest to feeling like, oh, there's a world here, but then the movie and the narrative is so poor mm-hmm. that you don't, who gives a fuck if there's ash coming close to you? Because uh, at that point, there's not a good movie. You know? yeah. That makes it, me sad. I was that's why it's hard when you, the games. when you talk about creating a roller coaster. It's hard because you you want to create the roller coaster, but then there also has to be has to be a good ride. Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's not just the roller coaster. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I thought that's the funny thing. I think Drive Angry satisfies both of those, and I'm mm-hmm. surprised. It also felt like a throwback to like uh, true exploitation cinema yeah. of the 70s, and it just I'm surprised it didn't. Connect. I, I'm not. I'm, I was at the time, but I'm not now. I mean, I understand. I mean, look, it's it's what we talked about. Mm. There were a ton of 3D movies coming out that sucked, mm. and the audience was sick of it. Yeah. And I, I don't blame them. They didn't know we shot in 3D. They didn't care we shot in 3D. Why would they? They don't care the difference between shooting in 3D and you know, some guy in Iowa, in Iowa or, or Ohio. They don't care. Right. Yeah. But um, there was that, and there was also, you know, Nick had had a whole bunch of movies come out just before that. It's just, it seemed like everything that uh, could have gone wrong for that process went wrong. But, you know, we made, we wrote a script and we went out and we sold it. Mm. There wasn't a whole lot, there wasn't any development. There was nothing. When we met with DeLuca, he wasn't, we had already gone with a different, we sort of in our heads gone with a different producer. We met with Mike DeLuca and out of basically courtesy to our agency, they said, you've got to meet with him. He's really excited. He's Mike DeLuca. All right, fine. And I was like, you know, he greenlit my first movie, greenlit Jason X. We got to go meet with him. Within, literally within five minutes, he was quoting the pink dildo line. I mean, he he loved the movie. And we, were, yeah, I looked at Patrick, <laughs> and we both knew he's the one. And so, you know, from that point forward, it just, you know, it was great. And you, you're about to business. get that in three D. I want to see that in three D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, I, it's it's on my it. it's on my kitchen counter. Sorry. Yeah, it's all right, man. <laughs> uh, I have a, before we wrap up. I have a couple of questions from Facebook. I told people that you're coming on. Um, and the good thing is we answered like ninety percent. Yeah, of these I, I'm sure most of them we got. But there's there's one or two that we didn't that are worth uh, bringing up. Uh, Steve Johnson on Facebook. He's got a question for Todd and us. Uh, but for Todd, um, how much typically gets lost in translation between script and screen? Hypothetically, if you know the budget before the writing process begins, then how often are you pleased slash let down by what you see on screen interpreted by the filmmakers? I so mean, it's it's different for every film. I mean, for um, uh, certainly for as far as the budget is concerned, for uh, you know, we went into Drive Angry thinking we had a lot more money than we actually had, mm-hmm. and I I mean, can't get into the numbers, but we is so. But that, that's a good thing, at least from a storytelling standpoint. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have fast five, fast six kind of money. So if we had a problem, we'd outthink it. Yeah. And so when we come up, you know, we had no rain days. If if it rained, we were screwed because it's not like you could just shut down production. You know, it's, it, you know, we shut down production, the production shuts down forever. Mm-hmm. We just didn't have the money. And so we knew that there was a week of rain coming and we had an entire set piece set outside. So we literally within hours rewrote it so that it took place in a church. And while we were shooting into that church, it was pouring outside. Wow. <laughs> and so all those scenes in that church, it was coming up. It was coming down outside. And that's what you got to do. And so what was the first part of the question? Uh, it was that, how, how much gets lost in translation between yeah, script to screen. That, but, the, <clears throat> what, you know, in that situation, at least for Drive Angry, we were the ones making the changes. Right. It wasn't like somebody else came in and they were second guessing and they were, you know, it, we were the guys making the change. So I loved that. Same thing with Bloody Valentine for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Jason X was a completely different thing because Jason X changed, messengers changed. But that's just part of the process. You right. Know, if you're the producer and you have the money and you're the studio, you're going to do what you want to do. I understand that. Yeah. I just, I'm looking for the world that I get to make the final decision. So I'm <laughs> king. I need to be king. I, I want to be part of that world. <laughs> uh, and uh, also from Steve Johnson, for all of us, uh, because I said what our topics would be. Um, he says, I believe the original let the right one in to be superior to the remake. Uh, wait, marginally superior to the remake. Uh, but I view the horror couple of Owen and Abby in the remake as more eloquent, sympathetic and endearing than the one of Oscar and Ellie in the original. Do you guys agree with my assessment or is there more endearing coupling for you personally uh, of the two I've listed. So let the right one in. Uh, we didn't mention that. That is a great. That is it a is. great one. Romantic couple. For me, I, uh, I have a problem with the remake. So I, I'm more about Oscar and Ellie from the original. I think that's a very beautiful and pure story. Uh, you know uh, about just true love. It's like yeah. she is discovering. It feels more. Like al- it feels more alien to me, and that's why I like it. Yeah. The remake feels more real. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's we were talking as, about that beforehand, accessibility of films, how some films kind of, you know, you feel at arm's distance and mm-hmm. therefore it kind of, it either, you know, creates a tone of, I don't get it or a, it's kind of a loof. And yeah. that's how the original was for me, but yeah. I liked it. Yeah, I liked it. It's, it's kind of yeah. magical, the first one, and kind of like a fairy tale. Also, like we can never underestimate the power of seeing the first thing. Yeah. And yeah. those two came close. It's like yeah. when you're when you're remaking something from like 20 years before, it's a totally different thing. Yeah. When yeah. you're making something a year later, and you, and people so are so close. aware of how good it was. Yeah. And then and the thing is, I thought the film that the American version was like literally, I thought it was probably one of the best directed films I'd seen that year. And yet I still didn't like it that much mm-hmm. because the other one was so good. Yeah. I just looked at it like I could kind of step out of it and go, he made a really he did a great job as a director on this, but yeah. I don't care that much because I already am kind of in love with this other one. In terms of the couple, maybe maybe the couple were at a certain age that connected to them, you know. I do think uh, what's the actress in the new one? Um the oh, um, the she, Abigail Breslin is there? Yeah. No, the girl that plays Carrie. Carrie, yeah. It's, uh, oh, that's her name. That's not Abigail Breslin. Chloe Moretz. Chloe, Chloe Moretz. Uh, she's, yeah. I think that's probably the reason. I think probably because she's just so good and she's shining she through at a great. young age and is connecting to you, you know? They, they just changed the reasoning behind their connection in both versions. And, and like, I, I didn't like what they defined in the remake. Yeah. Whereas I felt like it was more pure in the original where it's like she was looking for a part of her humanity through the boy. Right. And he was looking for just to not be afraid and be strong, which is what she tried to teach him. I don't know. I just, I think the orig- original is one of I my agree. top 10 movies of the last decade. It, it I is. Just, it's I one of the most original. Right so much. Yeah. And, yeah, I agree. and it's interesting to see the dark side of, of love also portrayed in that same film because yeah. because the fa- the father the father figure who's actually the, the boyfriend uh, killing for her you know grows to be it's such a one sided obsessive kind of relationship yeah. you know yeah so it's yeah no that's well yeah good... it's different in the in the book in the original movie yeah. what what his actual role is yeah. good questions though yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, Elliot uh, Craig Trigger. Perry wants to ask <laughs> <laughs> you tell that dick <laughs> he's he's listening so he's listening <laughs> you know uh, we get along now. no yeah. we don't. Uh, Elliot Traeger <laughs> asks, do you have any stories about working with Robert Silverman? His scene in Jason X is one of my favorite parts. He's the guy, he's the character actor. He's, uh, they call him up on the phone and he, like, and wake oh, him up. Oh, no, no, I never knew. He was a, he was a great friend of Jimmy's. Uh-huh. And so J- he and Jimmy had worked together. I guess he'd worked with Cronenberg he, Yeah, he did, uh, he did some Cronenberg stuff, I think. Yeah. Maybe he's a Canadian actor and that's why. Yeah, he's Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, because Kane and I were the only non, uh, we were the only blokes oh. in the movie. All right. Um, but uh, no, he. But I, I didn't get to act with him. I, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't there when I was there. He had that one little bit part. Yeah, and uh, I'm pretty pretty sure at that point that he was uh, in a chair. I don't, I don't think he could walk at that point. Yeah. And so that's why we shot it the way we shot it, so that he, you know, could go around that. He's just in bed sleeping. Um. Pretty much. I mean, we pretty much covered everything else. The only other thing, roughly, just and maybe we could all answer this. But uh, Amanda Oakes uh, wrote us about uh, Friday the 13th. Um, if there was another sequel, what direction would we want to take it in? Or well, I was going to ask wow. him if, if, if you pitched because everyone yeah, sounded like they pitched. Yeah, everybody yeah. pitched. Are you kidding? I put Jason in space. They ain't, <laughs> they ain't, <laughs> you're not invited they to They ain't pitch. coming to me to urinate on me. <laughs> if, if, if you were going to do something with them, where, where would you have taken I know a lot of people wanted snow. They're pushing found, found footage. footage. They're pushing found footage for, for you know. Financials? Yeah, it's cheap. Yeah. 
That's real cheap. But not cheap by their standards, because they're like, oh, let's do a $12 million found footage. Found footage is 3D. Cheap. I mean, yeah, for studio like, picks. But that's, but that's because that $12 million is basically... Marketing. And, well, no, it's, oh, uh, it's that's, that, that is... Um, their producer fees. Fees. Yeah, because I mean, like Devil's <laughs> Due was a twelve million dollar oh found really? footage film. It was That's it was insane. pretty. Although up it's there. not, I gotta look that up. I got somebody's pocket, but it's I'm not sure. Platinum yeah. Dunes. Let me double right? check that. But I, no, I swear no, that one had a not, high. Not, so Platinum Dunes is out. It's I mean, Paramount. No, it is Platinum Dunes. Mm, did they Friday? Have to, no, they're still involved. But what there was that whole Christopher Nolan story where they had to they bought a piece of no, his next Par- film to buy Paramount, out Paramount is doing it but it's still Platinum Dunes producing the movie. Uh, yeah, they're still oh, they're still there's on board. There's where your 12 million's going. If you've got yeah. two studios involved, there's right. a lot of fees there. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's it you know, and it's not you, look, if you're a studio and you can get the fee, then get the fee. It's it's that's your prerogative. But yeah. uh, no. Uh, found footage is definitely cheaper to shoot. I mean, we dealt with it on Halloween, we dealt with it on uh, Hellraiser. It was always the brought elements up. That, yeah, it's like, "Hey, we'd like to do it like this." And, hmm. uh, oh, I, I well, I was slightly off, but it's still insane. The budget um, listed for Devil's Due is seven million, hmm. which is still for a. Film they made it look film. like seventy five thousand, right? That's like, <laughs> it's like it makes no sense to have that kind of budget for a and camcorder look, movie. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. that makes no sense at all. It's like they're suddenly going to try to pull us. Oh, this is a found footage three D film. Yeah, we're going to have two camcorders filmed side by side. So it makes no sense. It's an, yeah. it's such a weird technique because it's I mean, found footage is always the one that you go to when you don't have a budget. It's rare that I've seen a found footage film that I think, no, they made that for art reasons. It wasn't just to, you know, budget it. Blair Witch Project was definitely one of them. Some of the earlier ones before we really understood that found footage could be done cheaply was one. Mm-hmm. Um, the new one, British Borderlands. Mm-hmm. That is the best use of found footage Ever, well, ever. I mean, Cloverfield is a good expensive Cloverfield one. Cloverfield is a, a good one. expensive yeah. one. But yeah, but when I hear they're doing these like multi-million dollar found footage films, it just, it makes me question why. Yeah. So, well, the thing about found footage for me was always the, the belief that it could be real. I can't believe that Jason Voorhees is real. I know mm-hmm. he is like Santa Claus. I, I, I know this because, yeah. you know, I'm an, an adult. <laughs> He's been around for a while. And so it's so to see a found footage that you're really only showing me sort of it's it's like a haunted house. So it's it's a trick. And, and I'm OK with that. Mm-hmm. But I want to go to the house that's really haunted. You know, the one that, you know, when I'm doing found footage. So that's why Blair Witch was so terrifying to me, because Blair Witch felt real. That's why the first paranormal was, felt real to me. Yeah. But yet, you know what? My argument is defeated because there's now 20 paranormal activities and they all are found footage and everybody knows it's not real. Well, I think I think what it is is found footage needs to be a different term because now it's a technique. Mm-hmm. Like found footage is like you were describing, <laughs> yeah. like Blair Witch, where we're finding something unedited. Cloverfield's the same Assuming way. Assuming the people are all deceased. Yeah. And then finding out what happened. That, to I mean, them. Yeah. that's what I liked about Cloverfield is the way they showed backstory is it was that little like... Mm-hmm. It, it, what they erased and you get to see a couple seconds yeah. of what was originally yeah. on the tape but now it's just a technique and um now it's first person because, restricted because, pov that's yeah. what it could be called call it, it's an aesthetic it's, right. it's yeah like because the, we're used to people d- shooting shit on their phone well, and mm-hmm. uploading it to youtube it's like that's what we see all the time so it's just you know i mean filmmakers created it because they didn't have the money right and so now the people who have the money are utilizing it so they don't have to spend the money. Yeah, it's amazing. But they're still spending the money, <laughs> which is where that oh, they're keeping the my money. conversation. So. Right, that's true. <laughs> but that, we need to do a show on found footage. Yeah, yeah. it'll yeah. happen that's on coming up. So, Side story about um, the, the Friday franchise, but there were a bunch of Jason X comics and things after the fact. Did, did mm-hmm. you ever read any of those or know anything about that? I, I have one or two of the books, mm-hmm. one or two of the novelizations, but... Uh, Oh, that's yeah. right. They did novelizations so, and everything mm-hmm. in set in that world. Was, uh, the, there was a there was a moment in time when I was supposed to sign a piece of paper that said I created the Uber Jason. Yeah, I probably should have signed that. You should, have. <laughs> yeah. Because hmm. so, no, uh, I remember you telling a story that if you had gotten to do a sequel to Jason X, what you would have done is had Uber Jason go sort of back in time and fight. The regular Jason. That would have been well. I, I had planned because I'd heard that Kevin did uh, three movies or had three screams planned. I'm not sure he really did. I think yeah, he just Kevin Williamson said that. But uh, so I thought, well, that's a good idea. And so while we were there filming, I came up with two other films, and one would take place mostly on Earth Two, which is you know, uh, Earth Two dealing with this Uber Jason character, and at the end of it, they would send him into a, a wormhole or. A, teleportation or I forget what it was, but, uh, so that 
movie three was basically him in 1980 Crystal Lake facing Jason. That's awesome. Oh, wow. That's but I, I rem- awesome. yeah, I remember a comic book that had that cover. It was Jason versus Uber Jason. And I was just like, Probably. oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So, I, I'm going to. Didn't get, didn't get paid for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's it we have for that's questions. That's pretty wild, yeah. yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the show, My man. My pleasure. Happy Valentine's Day to you and to Rebecca and to yeah. Elric and everybody listening. Yeah, and I'm going to keep eating this chocolate, by the way. Eat the chocolate. Uh, anything else we need to promote before we wrap it? We will actually not be here next week because yep. I'm stepping out of town and we have... Decided not to do a show without each other. Yes. Yes. That's right. We work best together. It's so romantic. <laughs> Isn't yeah. it? Yeah. We're going to go on the uh, movie crypt. Oh, oh yeah. really? It's great. They don't we invite do us. They've never invited <laughs> us. We have We're them not on. filmmakers. <laughs> oh, we did have them on. They still don't. We are filmmakers. <laughs> I know. I'm just <laughs> saying. <laughs> just, just not paid for it yet. Yeah. Exactly. We're all, uh, we've all made Hey, films. I had meetings today. And all yesterday. Right. Yeah. Meetings. Yeah. Meetings, meetings in that sounds like... Uh, <laughs> I, I made a movie once. I ate it was breakfast. All right. <laughs> yeah. What's that? The I thing, made a movie once. It was all right. Yeah. 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 Even when you've it's made cool. a movie, you still don't get paid for <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. It doesn't exactly. matter. Sure. They stopped paying a long time ago. Yeah. I get paid for the day job, not for the movie. Yeah. Is it exactly? Uh, I don't even get paid yeah, for my day job. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, just uh, again, as usual, uh, comment on the Geek Nation page, comment on the iTunes, rate and review us. Uh, Jump on our Facebook. Let us know what you thought of some of our suggestions. What are your favorite 3D movies? What are your favorite uh, horror couples? Did, did you, you know? see Crawl? Did you yeah, see Crawl? Yes. In did 3D? you see it in 3D? Or was or it Metal Storm? Storm? Maybe, this, maybe we can prove that this really happened. <laughs> I think the filmmakers of Crawl have no idea. I that think somebody... it's Metal Storm and okay. you're delirious. Uh, yeah. And also, yeah, uh, congrats to Jay Michael Kober, who won the Night Facebook the comment, which was great. You guys had like 40 sing responses, which was fantastic. I think we should do more of that stuff. Yeah. yeah we definitely that worked will. Really well. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Okay. Well. Sweet. Happy Valentine's Day, guys. Yep. I love you all. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha.